Okay, in about 10 minutes, I'm going to check it. You won't come let us in until it starts. So just remember that if you start walking around your house and you're somewhere you shouldn't be with uh, the camera on. And at this, I'll also quickly go over if it's all right. So the social media that we are on Facebook and we are also on Meetup. Those are two other ways to find out about the meetings besides the emails. I encourage everyone to check in on Facebook to this meeting. That helps it grow so more people find out about the PC RIA page, and then we get more followers. That means more interactions, and we can all grow together. That ties in well that we have a Facebook group. So there's a page, which is just the PC RIA putting out information, and then there's a group, which is a private group. And that means that you can ask questions if it's in between the meetings, and other people can just answer and chime in. And that's all I have. Okay, so now we know the rules. Also, sometimes whenever we're speaking, it may sound like we're uh, speaking over each other. I know a lot of you have been doing Zooms. You've heard it. You know it happens. It definitely happens with us because we are, uh, we don't know what we're doing. So we're learning every single week what the heck we're doing. And we're bound to make mistakes. If you hear us talk over you or we mute you, uh, then just know we're doing it with love and we're not doing it on purpose to... Uh, for it to be a negative thing. So there you go. I don't think we have too much delay tonight, which is nice. Yeah, a lot of nights we've had a delay, which makes the talking over each other really, really fun when it's a four second delay. Yeah, so I think we're doing good tonight. Listen, um, let me tell you what our mission here is, at PC RIA is. I love our mission. Our mission is all about the fact that we love real estate investing. I mean, I love being a landlord. I love being a flipper. I love doing all of it. It's the greatest job in the world. Nothing else that I'm capable of doing. <laughs> I, I am in a happy space when I am doing real estate investing. And I want to attribute my even saying this out loud in this way of how much we love real estate investing to David Tilney. I was sitting in one of his classes one time and he made that statement about how he felt it was the greatest job in the world. And when he said it, it resonated with me. I thought, you know, we just don't say it out loud enough how loud and proud we are of what a great, uh, what a great thing this is to do in life. I mean, you can buy properties and change neighborhoods. You can provide good housing for folks and treat them in a way maybe they've never been treated before, being really good to them. You can change lives uh, for generations by creating wealth that goes on way past our lifetime. And so where else can you do that? I mean, in, in the way that we do it, it's just wonderful. So uh, that is what we're all about here and the education to get you to that point. Um, also, uh, it, we really are about do no harm, truly share and support each other. We believe we rise up by lifting each other. There's true power and kindness. And we try to cultivate that here at PC RIA. I think you'll see it if you come to our meetings um, and uh, you participate with what we do. We are all about investors supporting investors. 
In fact, let me tell you about our meetings. We don't know when we're going to open up again for uh, regular in-person meetings. We have no idea. But uh, we are going to continue these Zoom meetings even after we open up and start having our regular meetings where we meet every month. Right now, we're having four to five meetings per month, uh, one every single week. Uh, most of those are for members only. Uh, we have one meeting a month like this right here where it's for everyone and anyone. It's free to everyone. And then after that, all of these other meetings, we're having what we call our midday um, mindset or midday mastermind. mastermind thank you. M midday mastermind uh, meetings at lunch. And then uh, we have another 6.30 p.m. meeting in the evening once a month. It's also about hot topics where we talk about absolutely anything. Those are wonderful meetings. They feel private and intimate because it's not a huge uh, number of folks on there. And we just share absolutely everything with each other. Lots of resources, uh, places to get funding, uh, properties and deals. You also can pitch your deals there at those meetings. So we hope you'll join us and we hope you'll fall in love with us tonight if you're not already a member and you'll become a member so that you can be a part of all of these meetings that we have coming up. Um, let's go to our corporate sponsors. We'd like to give them just a moment at the beginning of the meeting here to give a shout out, see what they're up to, tell us a little bit about who they are. Uh, who do we have on the meeting tonight that's a corporate sponsor? I see it's Milton, you're right there. Right beside us, yeah. Milton, tell us, uh, say hello, and, and what are you up to? All right. Well, thank you, Liz. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, uh, this is so exciting because I did not anticipate that uh, we you were going to do so well uh, on Zoom. Uh, Liz and uh, Adrian and Chris and the rest of the team, you guys are doing a phenomenal job. I, I really wasn't sure what was going to happen, and this is very unexpected. <laughs> <laughs> and I am just so proud of you. I, I need to help more when Thank I can. You. you guys, it's incredible. Okay, um, so yes, I'm a licensed real estate agent. We are own a small office and I uh, help people that need to buy, sell, uh, do as property management as well. But really what I love the absolute most are creative deals. And you know, it just so happens that tonight we're gonna have uh, one of the people that I think has got one of the most incredible minds, Pete Fortunato. That First class I attended with him was like 10 years ago in Tampa. And uh, anyways, uh, if I can help anybody uh, in the capacity of a real estate agent with comparables, the correct ARV, that kind of thing, things that I'm not gonna charge you a penny for, I'm happy to do that. But just know I can talk creative and it's my passion. A real estate brokerage kind of pays the bills, but being an investor is really what, uh, what it's about for me. Uh, I love both though, so if I can help anybody with anything at all, uh, just reach out to me, give me a call, and I'm happy to help any way that I can. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I tell you what, you need a good, any of you out there, you know this, if you've been doing this at all any length of time, you having a good realtor or more than one on your side is invaluable. And when you have someone like Milton, who is an investor himself and knows how to create uh, deals that are structured in a way that's a win-win for everyone. Well, you just can't beat it. I mean, he can he can make deals happen when uh, maybe another realtor might not be able to just because he's got the training. He he, he invests in education, and uh, and he's a super guy. I mean, goodness gracious, are we lucky to have him in our group? So, thank you so much, Milton. We appreciate you. Thank you, Liz. Hey, another great guy we have that I see popping up here. Okay, Frank, you're already smiling, so you know I'm talking about you. So, Frank Falco, tell us who you are and what you're doing in life. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you started it. <laughs> uh, my, my name is Frank Falco. I'm a full-time investor, and my wife and uh, I and my daughter, Cindy, uh, we run Equity Title here in Lakeland. Uh, we do closings all over the state of Florida and we've been doing it for in this building for 19 years and um, we've been doing quite a bit of mobile home work right now mobile homes on land and boy you'd be surprised how many of them before we get them are really messed up so um, <laughs> shaking your head Adrian <laughs> I'm not that surprised but yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
it's you know doing a mobile home if you if you ever plan on selling it down the road you better get it done when you buy it because it's just going to be a nightmare later on but anyways we're uh we're investor experienced um and uh, like i said we do uh short sales we do land trust um we do owner financing uh you name it we can do it uh if you if you need title insurance give us a shout give us a try and experience the equity title difference our phone number is 863-802-9300 and we've worked all the way through the uh, covid so we're still open and uh, we do practice social distancing and we sanitize our place every morning before we even start and then even after the closing so uh anytime you need us give us a call thanks awesome that is really great and it's my understanding maybe you just said it um uh, but uh you can just about go anywhere or do anything any kind of closing anywhere can't you no matter what the circumstance yeah that's true we don't have to go anymore um they've got this new closing where or this new type of closing it's a platform that they have and it's kind of like a zoom call and you have a, 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 the the clients on the other end we're on one end and we can actually approve the notarizations right online so um as we're watching them so it's it's just real easy we've got still got the mobile notaries that go out there um if we if we go locally we go all the way to orlando or even farther if we have to so whatever it takes to close the deal that's what we're going to do very good very good another thing uh frank i will just want to shout out because you being an investor again any time that we can do business with fellow investors whatever services they provide man you just can't beat it because they're going to know what they need to do for you as an investor and that is so valuable we appreciate you frank well let me give it let me give you my phone number okay if there's a way that i can help you like milton says if there's any way he can help you or tim davis any of any of us we can help you feel free to call us and we'll we'll chat with you it's um 863 Five two nine seven five five three. That's my, that's my cell phone. Uh, eight six three five two nine seven five five three, and I'll guide you the best I can. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Frank. Okay, I think we have a couple. Let's see, Catherine. Catherine, you're in the house. Can have you learned I how to unmute yourself, house. Catherine? <laughs> I did. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Tell us about your world and what you got for us. Well, I've been working straight through this whole COVID thing. I've been so blessed to have quite a few PC RIA people contact me. Um, of course, there's a lot of stuff going on in people's um, homes where they live, you know, with everybody stuck inside. People are thinking about what they're doing at home and now's the time to fix it while they're there and uh, so we've been really quite busy um, one of the things that um, is a little bit of an update as far as some of our investor friendly products you know when when i started with pc ria we dealt um, predominantly with um, american made cabinets and um, one of the things that I did bring in was some very high quality products that were made in China. There's a lot of stuff out there that's not high quality, but we, we have some that really is. But we've been um, hit with some pretty severe um, import tariffs this last year. I'm, I'm in the fourth wave of serious tariffs on Chinese products, but I'm happy to say that one of our favorite vendors um, has retooled and opened up manufacturing in Vietnam. And we are bringing in a lot of cabinets from Viet Vietnam, which is really important to me because my husband is a Vietnam vet and we did a lot of damage to that country and i'm really happy that we can do something to help rebuild that country hmm. so some of the nicest products that we're bringing in from overseas right now are actually coming in from vietnam 
So we've got, um, we're, we're still doing a lot of business with our American um, companies as well. We've got um, all kinds of price points and things available. We do everything from custom colors. We can, we can have cabinets built that are any color that Sherwin Williams makes or Benjamin Moore, which is about 3000 colors. Um, so we can, we can do it all. And, um, um, here, if anybody wants, you know, consultation on how they can maybe save money by design, I go out and help them lay out a plan and maybe give them fresh eyes on a, a piece of property that, you know, I might be able to think of some way to do something that you haven't thought of yet. And uh, so I do that a lot. That's, that's one of my favorite things to do is go out and help you figure out the puzzle and then help you figure out how to use your money the best. So You've definitely um, done that for me, uh, Catherine, and many of us here at PC Rhea. I know I've done hundreds and hundreds of flips thought I knew everything about kitchens you you could know after doing so many and then Catherine waltzes right in and uh, shows me something on one that I had ordered from her a way that we could save some money in a design concept that I hadn't even thought about so she can uh, absolutely do this for you guys if you're uh, facing doing some remodeling and she'll do it whether you buy cabinets from her or not she's amazing <laughs> <laughs> this is true. I believe I helped you install cabinets that were bought by somebody else. So <laughs> you absolutely did. In fact, you walked in there with a screwdriver yeah. and showed my guys what they were doing wrong. So yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you can't beat that. I, I love what I'm doing. <laughs> this is my 43rd year remodeling kitchens and bathrooms. So <laughs> it's it's a real it's a real part of me i can tell you that so <laughs> great glad to have so you here tonight and be I a part help, of Cecilia. yeah my my phone number is 863-206-6121 and uh you can call me you can text me i figure out jobs from literally sketches on napkins so you can you can shoot photographs of a job and send me measurements and i can work up a plan for you so um sometimes i can help shortcut um your even your bids on a piece of property with Okay, thank you, Catherine. We sure appreciate you. Thank you very much. You um, do we have any other? Do we have any other uh, corporate sponsors, Adrian, on the call? I don't think I see anybody else. I don't see anyone else either. Did someone we missed okay. possibly that we don't recognize a name? Sometimes names. If you will, uh, one thing, so. if you'll do for me, Adrian, could you pull up the one on uh, best transactional funding for me? Yep. Uh, if, if you guys will look on your screen, there is best transactional funding. That's David Dinkle. He could, he's not on the call right now tonight, but I just wanted to bring it to your attention um, because he's a new corporate sponsor. We're proud and happy to have him be a part of our group. And uh, he does provide transactional funding all over the United States. Um, and so if you guys need any assistance with that, you know that you can definitely reach out to him. We, we love to have him. Um, also, um, I want to shout out to Monica at the firm because um, Monica just recently uh, did something for someone that was amazing. She, this, this is someone, this is the firm. Do you have that one, Adrian, up there? Um, this is for, really for retail uh, financing and funding. She doesn't do any private stuff for uh, investors. But if you yourself need a loan or you have anybody or you're selling your property and you would like to someone to hook up with someone who you know can close the deal, Monica Young can make it happen. She just made it happen for someone and it was a very, very, very good uh, situation where someone else did not think they could get it closed and she was able to do it. 
So I so appreciate that. Um, let's see. I think that's about it for corporate sponsors. So don't forget, guys, uh, speaking of corporate sponsors and you uh, making sure you spend your dollar with folks that you can support, here in Lakeland, they just announced, hang on one second, I got to find my thing here. They just announced that uh, starting Friday, I know you all have been waiting on bated breath to find out when you can go to have a beer and go to a bar. Finally, Friday, tomorrow, they are opening it up in Lakeland, Florida. There will be a flood of people coming in, I know, because everybody's so excited. There'll be a true happy hour happening. So just know that. And then on Saturday, the farmer's market will be happening. It will be open again. All theaters are also opening up on Friday. So this is good news for all of us uh, as far as that goes. And um, also in Lakeland, let me just say, well, let me, let me preface this. You know, in the, you all may have seen the announcement that um, our governor has extended the moratorium on uh, evictions. So that is going to be on July 1st, okay, supposedly. Hope, hopefully he doesn't extend it further than that. Now, I've been lucky, and I haven't had anybody that I need to evict. I have one I'd like to evict, but I don't have any that I need to evict just yet. So I hope you've been as blessed as I have. Uh, but if you haven't and you're facing that, just know that you cannot even send out a three-day notice, okay? Don't do that, or you're going to get in some serious trouble. Can I throw something in there real quick? Absolutely. So I, I shared personally on uh, the Facebook group, uh, maybe an hour, hour and a half ago from um, another group that I, uh, I'm going blank on his name in, in Tampa. But anyways, he posted that there is apparently kind of a scam going on that uh, lawyers are telling their tenants to ask for a three-day notice because they need it for their rent assistant programs and every matt funks thank you kevin matt funks uh, he has a landlord group so they're telling you to ask the tenants to ask for a three-day notice so then the lawyer can go after the landlord my so, goodness yeah so here we go just be careful about that and that came from evictions.com uh, uh harry heist that's where he sourced it from so it's it's in one reason to stay connected with investors in general. And then like the Facebook group, you know, we try to share stuff like that when we hear about it, just gotta be careful. Hey, Adrian, can I say something for a second? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we really gotta be, we really got an issue there too, because some of these uh, tenants need a three day notice to give to agencies to get help. Um, I actually had one ask for, you know, they needed me to give them a three day notice they give it to the agency. They, they have to have something to give the agency that says that they're behind on the rent to get assistance. So I don't know what the right answer is, but we're going to be walking it, a tightrope trying to figure that out, I guess. If it was me, I would give them an unofficial, so not a demand <clears throat> letter. I, that's just what I would do with um, my lack of trust is something like that we are personally sending out um non-demand letters just saying hey you owe rent but i don't I think we want to get too deep into that right now maybe that's the after hours topic could you not quick, but... just send them could you not just send them a statement showing that they're behind here here is uh uh adrian just mentioned uh Harry Heist, he's an attorney that all he does is uh, landlord general law for property managers. It is a different form. It's actually a reminder letter. It's done by an attorney. If anybody needs it, just send me an email, call me. My number is area code 863-899. I'll, I'll put it on the chat box here. But uh, that really is the only notice, it's not even a notice, it's just, it's called reminder letter. It's very uh, purposely uh, worded, very carefully worded by, by Harry Heist, the attorney. Uh, it's the only thing you should be uh, serving right now until after the, uh, you know, July 1st timeframe. So I'll put my number. If you need that form, just 
text me and uh, tomorrow I'll be happy to send it to you. Thank you. Thank you, Milton. Also, just to let you all know, now this is about non-payment of rent, okay? You are allowed to evict for other reasons, okay? And in the email I sent, you can, you can look all this up, it'll tell you. Uh, however, even though you can evict them, let's say it's the, they're a holdover tenant and it's the end of their lease and you want them to leave, you're not going to reinstate a lease, you know, uh, whatever. Anything else that's not non-payment. You can evict, you, at least you can file the paperwork. But I called down at the courthouse in Pope County and I discovered that although you can file the paperwork, they, they, they will receive it. It will not go to the judges though, uh, because uh, they will not serve any, I mean, it will go to the judges, but they will not serve any papers. So your writ of possession and it, even your summons are not going to be delivered. So that means it's just gonna be on hold. They are, they are recommending down there you go ahead and file the paperwork if you want to so that you're sort of in the queue, if you will. And then when they open it up and they can actually serve, then you'll already have most of your processing or you'll be in line to get it processed. Uh, so that's up to you guys. But I'm just, just letting you know what they told me down there. Okay, I see that Alex Pierney uh, with Advantage just joined us. So Alex, uh, all the corporate sponsors said a little something about themselves, and I'm glad you showed up because you have some great events coming up for folks. Uh, can you tell us about what's going on over at Advanta? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Liz. Um, and uh, Joe, uh, I see you on here. I'm sorry I haven't had a chance to reach out to you, but uh, we still want to uh, put something together. But with regard to what Liz is talking about, one of the most uh, frequent questions I get asked, um, besides, you know, how not to pay taxes, which I'm more than happy to tell people how or what legal ways there are to do it, um, or not do it, uh, is how to get in front of our clients or how to network with the people that we have, because we've been in business for about 20 years doing investments in the uh, AFA area for clients. So next week, we're hosting an open networking event through Zoom uh, for anyone that would like to come and uh, we're going to have haves and wants. We're going to um, kind of do a guided discussion, not too much unlike what we do here at PC RIA or other RIA events around the area, but we invite everyone to come. Um, you know, if you have a property that you'd like to sell or you're looking for something, you'll be able to interact with um, anyone from our entire client database that's on there. Uh, it will not be recorded, um, so you don't have to, you know, worry about us putting, you know, your personal information out on our YouTube channel or anything like that. It's going to be a nice uh, insulary forum for people to come and, uh, and try to get some interaction during this time. So we're excited about it, myself and Larissa Green, so the other half of our uh, Tampa sales team, we're going to be hosting it. So it's going to be kind of like a... Um, <clears throat> just like uh, Liz and Adrian do on this, it's gonna be a, kind of a guided discussion, but we invite everyone to come. Uh, you know, if you wanna come, it is of course free. Uh, it'll be held from, uh, we'll probably kind of start it at a similar fashion to this. It'll be around lunchtime. So we'll probably get things started around 11.45 and then they'll go to, we'll probably cap it at about two hours, but uh, we'd encourage everyone to come. We have a license for Zoom that carries up to 500 people. So hopefully we can, I, I highly doubt we'll get that many, but uh, we would love to to try to, to try to do that. But again, um, we'd like to invite everyone here. We'll be sending out emails, our current client or in our database. I believe the email will go out tomorrow initially. And then also, I believe uh, Liz is going to send it out to people in PC Korea as well. So, um, you know, if you know people yeah. here would like to join, uh, feel free. Again, you know, it's free. You're going to be able to get in front of uh, our clients, our contacts, so you're going to be able to network with people and we want to make it a more um, uh, regular event. And we'll also bring in speakers like we do for our guest webinars. But we're trying to, uh, you know, be a benefit of people in this kind of uh, world we live in, if you will. <laughs> we all have to be a little bit distant from each other. So that's, that's really the big news from us. Um, we have, uh, again, you know, pretty much always have bi-weekly webinars going on during the stuff. I did one on HSAs. Uh, and COVID-19 uh, this Tuesday that just went out. And uh, I believe we have another one on Tuesday of next week as well as our networking event. So if you have any questions, give me a shout. Numbers up there on the screen. If you're just listening in, it's 727-754-9954. Or if you also know my colleague, Larissa, you can just give her a shout as well. Uh, she'll be happy to help you with uh, getting set up to um, attend on Zoom. So thanks, Liz, for, for helping out with it. Yeah, Alex, what I heard you say is open networking 
with your clients, meaning people that possibly want a, to lend their money out passively, which people are always asking, where do they get private money? And I would think networking as something that you have could be an opportunity absolutely. for finding a private money lender. Yeah, absolutely. Again, um, you know, we are not endorsing or promoting any investment. Um, that's, you know, one reason why we're not recording it and putting it out there. And again, it's, you know, you can come say your piece and try to network and um, it's open to clients, non-clients. So essentially you'll have a, a huge cross section of, of people that, you know, have accounts with us that are investing. Uh, to give you kind of an idea, uh, we manage about $1.3 billion worth of capital for our clients across 7,000 accounts or so. So, um, you know, it goes out to a lot of people. Obviously, they're not all going to be on the call um, as much as I'm sure some of you would like to try to find some money out there. But, um, you know, they're, they're, they're people that are out there. And we're going to try to help people uh, to the best of our ability to meet that work up, you know, put things together, help, you know, secure their financial futures. And, and we're, uh, we're excited about it. It's kind of, it's, it'll be fun. Um, so, again, come one, come yeah. on. And uh, let's try to make this a, a good event. This sounds awesome. great. I just want to I want to remind people of something talking about uh, Zoom etiquette and stuff. So here here Alex is and Advanta they're going to offer this great opportunity for us to zoom in and connect with all of these wonderful people. I just want to tell y'all think about what you look like here because here's the thing you're going to have a camera on you and you want people to invest in you maybe maybe uh, loan you some money. So clean up a little bit, will you? Because not everybody looks as charming as Adrian and Alex do. They grew out their beard. They look nice. I mean, even Pete Fortunata, he, he's grown He looks like a mountain man, and he looks handsome and very sexy. But not all of us do. That's why I don't have video. My beard and, and mustache don't look too good right now. So I'm just telling y'all, remember that people can see you, okay? So... So or clean no. up a little bit. <laughs> I always forget that. I forgot that Pete was going to be on this call tonight or I would have shaved. I have beard envy. That thing is, uh, that thing's quite nice. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Right? How many guys uh, are able to do that and look that good? I don't know. It's crazy. All right. We're going to wrap this part of it up re as quickly as we can, but I do want to uh, just say that it, one last thing in, in this uh eviction thing that we were just talking about and it's being the moratorium being delayed until july 1st if you do have tenants that are living in the city of lakeland in your properties and are not paying or able to pay right now uh, they can still get some assistance and help um adrian can you mute folks i'm hearing some stuff going on i don't know so um here's what you need to know there's a program the city of lakeland has called the lakeland cares program c-a-r-e-s you can google it you can find it easy they just got 125 million dollars uh, recently to give out to people to help them with their rent and their utilities and it's very easy to comply with what their requirements are as long as they don't make uh, you know a certain uh, over a certain amount of money they need to be in distress they need to be able to show that the, you know they've been affected by covid and you can help them as their landlord. This money, as I understand it, gets paid directly to you, the landlord. So it is to your benefit to, to help them fill out their paperwork and do it. You can do everything online. Uh, this money, it's first come, first serve. So they will give up to $5,000 or three months rent, whichever comes first. So get them in there and get them in there strong and fast now. And there's other programs that are out there. That's just one that I know about. So at least maybe that'll help you. Of course, Pete said, he emailed and told me, he thinks we need to send our governor a bill for the rent that's due uh, for all these that are avoiding it. I think that might be a great idea. I'm sure he'll speak on that a little bit in a moment or two. But anyway, definitely take advantage of that if you will, folks. And if I find out about anything else, I'll try to let you know so that you can get your money. That's what, what we want to be able to do. Um, let's see. Oh, I just want to uh, let you know, oh, uh, uh, Adrian, oh, yeah, you got our disclaimer up there, Adrian. So everybody, I, while, you know, I don't want to put you to sleep, but please check out that disclaimer. It's all about, um, you know, taking care of the information we're going to be sharing with you tonight and knowing that uh, you need to do your own due diligence on anything and everything that we may be speaking on. So I appreciate you uh, checking that out while I'm going to tell you real quickly about the uh, upcoming meetings that we do have. We have some June 10th and 24th. Those are lunch, midday masterminds. 
we have uh, June 18th, which is 6.30 p.m. Hot Topics. And then on July 2nd is when we have another speaker like we do tonight uh, at 6.30 p.m. And that's for everyone. All the other meetings that we have are members only. Um, there is another one that's for anyone else, and that's Susan, or if you're on the line. Uh, can you tell us uh, when the next Lakeland Note Investment Group is meeting? Yes, the next one is the second Tuesday of the month. Let me see. Let me get in front of my calendar. And we always put it on our emails that we send out as well. You'll find it too. But uh, you're going to be doing another Zoom meeting, right? Correct. I have to get it set up again because I'm still new at this technical stuff. I want to make sure I don't put a password on it because then people have trouble getting in. So that's why I haven't set it up yet because I'm going to make sure I get help this time because <laughs> it was a little tricky. Okay. Last time. So it's the ninth. So this is of June. Tell us what it tell us what it's about so that people know what the note investment group is. Well, we just talked um, about what's going on in the note world and what's going to do a little bit. Those of us who are you know in the note world, there's some. Um, uh, we do a lot with Kevin Shortell. He's and Paper Stack was a guest on the Orlando Note Meetup. So they talk about what they're seeing as far as, you know, what's coming down the park with with uh, the securities and some of the bigger investors, how the marginal calls. Anyway, we talk about what's going on in the note world and how some of the bigger institutions and that and how that might translate into the future for those of us who might want to buy and sell notes. So if you're interested in buying yeah. notes or creating notes. So. And if pe people would like to know more about it, you can find it in our uh, PC RIA emails that we send out and look up the meetup group called, uh, what is the name of it, Susan, to make sure I have it right? Lakeland? Lakeland Note Meetup. Yep. And you can yes. get notified sure. about all of their meetings and everything. So thank you, Susan. I appreciate that. You're it's welcome. a great evening. People really enjoy it. If you're ever curious, you can be a beginner or an experienced person and get something out of those meetings uh, in regarding buying and selling paper. All right, now we are ready to go. Unless uh, Adrian, do I have anything else I need to cover? Or are we good? I think you're good. You got everything. Okay. Okay. Awesome. 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 It's wonderful to uh, have you all to here tonight. Uh, we are so excited to have Pete Fortunato as our guest speaker. He is undeniably one of the greatest deal structuring engineers I and many of his thousands of super fans have ever met. If you don't know Pete and you're on this call, well, you'll be a believer after tonight too. We know that. I can say it confidently because I've seen it happen over and over. Um, he's just a, a great investor and someone that we can learn so much about. Uh, Pete is one of the most generous folks that I know in sharing information out to people, uh, and you just can't go wrong. Uh, I went, to, I've been to several of his uh, classes. He has them occasionally. If you get the opportunity, you've got to do it. I know that he and Bill Cook are having one come up. I hope, Pete, you'll tell us about that before we end the evening tonight. Uh, one of the things that Pete says is um, wealth is plentiful, okay? It's, it's plentiful. It's plentiful for those who understand the simple rules of its acquisition. And that's what he's going to teach us about tonight. Uh, please, everybody, welcome tonight, Pete Fortunato. Uh, where are you, Pete? I was trying to find out where to push a button to make the thing let me talk. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Adrian, can we have him on here like how do we put him up on there so everybody can see him real big and all that stuff? I don't know how we do Ooh, that. There yeah, we go. There I am. Woo! <laughs> Lordy. Yeah, I'm sitting out on my porch. Um, okay. Well, I'm going to talk about um, investing and, and being a capitalist and trying to make a better life. But I'm going to start by saying I don't love real estate. I love people. I love helping people. And that's what, make, that's what enables you to be successful as an estate builder. Uh, realize the real estate won't do anything for you. The real estate gives you an opportunity to do something for yourself or for somebody else. And so when uh, I benefit and when any of you guys benefit in a deal, it's because you've enabled somebody else to benefit. And that means you do something for someone else or you put them in a position where they can do something better for themselves. 
one of the big issues or one of the big problems you get is that people in the United States have been so uh, trained to, to not think that they do the same things over and over and over again. And uh, one of the big things that they do that's a mistake is that they value things in terms of dollars. And the dollars are not what it's all about. People take steps, people take action when they feel a lack of something. And until they feel that lack, until they feel discomfort, they don't do anything. And so the values that you see in real estate come about because people's lives change. And if you're not interested enough in those people to find out what's going on, it's hard to make a deal. Now, what will happen is you'll end up talking to a, a realtor or to an attorney or to a barber or to somebody's mother-in-law. And they'll say, oh, no, that house is worth $295,000. That $295,000 is very different to some poor soul who puts it in Wells Fargo at one-tenth of 1% 1 interest than it is to someone who buys a home for his children, than it is for someone who buys a home that's closer to work, than it is for someone who lends the money to someone who will pay him uh, 100 times what Wells Fargo would pay him. That is your job. It is to find out what's going on in people's lives and to help them. To the extent that you help, you benefit. So that means you have to interfere. You have to care. The key to estate building is caring. First of all, you care about yourself and say, I'm going to get some assets. I'm going to get enough assets to provide me with enough income so I can do whatever I damn well please. So once you decide you're going to do that, now you've got to go out and make the plans and take the actions to do it. Well, once you've promised yourself something and you cared that much about yourself, you've got to care enough about others to discover what's their uncomfortable circumstance so you can help them and in so doing, get a benefit. So when I go out in pursuit of opportunities, many of you have heard me say I, I, my first question to anybody who's threatening to sell a house or who's even suggesting they might sell a house is, why would you sell a nice house like this? And after I ask that question, I shut my mouth and listen. And remember, a conversation is supposed to be bi-directional. And the theory is that you're supposed to be listening at least as much and preferably much more than you're speaking. So when I say, why would you sell a nice house like this? And then I get past the realtor who says, none of your business. And people say, I'm selling because the doctor said I can't do stairs. So that house that was very, very valuable to them yesterday, maybe for the last 40 years while they raised their family there, no longer is as valuable and might indeed be an impediment because of the risk of the stairs. When I was just a kid, before I got my real estate license, uh, so this must have been about 1963, my dad went out, he listed a house, and he sold it to a young couple. This all took him almost an hour and a half. And I was interested in how he did that. And he said, well, the people wanted to sell a house, so now my job is to say, who could use that house? He sold it to a young couple who had never owned a piece of real estate in their lives. Well, what had changed in their life is they were expecting their first child. So my dad sold them a house. Where do you think that house was? It was within a mile of their parents. Why was that house valuable to them. They were expecting a child and they valued free babysitting, convenient babysitting. Those are the kind of things that make value for people. Value is personal. I went to see someone I was referred to and almost everything I do now 
that I've done this since 1965. So almost everything I do is repeat and referral business. And I went to see a lady and it turned out that she had had a health problem. You can imagine how expensive that got for her. She was unable to work. She was uh, $24,000 in debt on credit cards, one of them at 19.9% and the other one at 29.9% of Visa card. I didn't know those, those rates were illegal. Um, made me wish I was a credit card company. But aside from that, I loved her house, but she didn't need to sell it. I had my IRA make a wraparound loan to her, wrapping her 5% first mortgage with $24,000 that she used to pay off the credit cards. Now, my IRA's yield on that wraparound was extraordinary because I collected 10% and paid the underlying five, but her payment went from 1500 a month to $600 a month. And I benefited her and didn't take her house away. I didn't need to take the house in that instance. I gave a lady $5,000 for an option to buy her house. The option did not get me the house, it got me the right to buy the house. She used the $5,000 to pay off a car loan, which gave her an additional $350 a month, which enabled her to stay in the house. In that case, I bought an option. My son called me one day and said, Dad, there's an old guy down here moving trash and working hard in a front yard. It looks like an opportunity. I drove down there. The guy had inherited a house. I leased the house for 10 years was unable to get an option to buy it, was unable to buy it. But by leasing it for 10 years, I got control of it. I got to get to know the gentleman very, very well over the next uh, half a dozen years. When the time came that he wanted to sell, he sold it to us. When he called me and he said, uh, Pete, I really have to sell this house now. And um, I'll sell it to you for $300,000, a waterfront house over here in Deer Beach. And he said, uh, you know, you've always paid me for these last six years. I will take $300,000, which was a good price. It was probably 75% of retail back in the day. Um, and I'll carry a mortgage for you. I said, well, you should come over to my house right away. And so he came to my house and we sat there. Now, I wanted him in my house where we could sit and visit and talk uninterrupted. And we sat there and I said, you know, what did you have in mind? He said, I'll sell the house for $300,000, which unquestionably was a good deal. He said, I'll take 150000 cash down and I'll carry $150,000. So I said, what are you going to do with the cash? Because the one thing we all know is no one wants cash. People want to go from something they like less to something they like more. And so when I said, what are you going to do with the cash? He said, oh, I have this tremendous opportunity in the stock market. And I said, oh, that is great. You came to the right place. You are so lucky you came to see me because I'm going to prevent you. I'm going to protect you from doing something that's stupid. I'm not giving you 150000 down. And I bought his house, no money down, $300,000 seller carry. All of those things did not happen because it was an MLS that way. It happened because I talked with the people who were in stress and I talked with them and listened to them about what was going on in their life. Now, today we were talking at the exchange meeting. Uh, someone had called me about a house in uh, New Smyrna Beach and the gentleman who owned the house had um, inherited the house and he was moving out of state and no one had bothered to talk with him about what his situation was he thought he had a free and clear house he'd inherited so this is a good thing now what does it cost to own an extra house well it costs property taxes and it costs insurance and vacant house insurance is expensive 
and it costs utilities and it costs lawn care. And so in his case, and I'm guessing, because I was not lucky enough to get face to face with this guy, that's $12,000 a year in negative cash flow, $1,000 a month going out. We structured a deal for a young man who wants the house to buy it for $1,500 a month in payments until the full price they'd agreed upon was paid. Now, what's that difference in the eyes of the person who's selling? That's a swing in their cash flow from 12,000 negative to 18,000 positive. That's $30,000 a year. That's $2,500 a month. Those benefits made that deal work. It's so very important to discover what is the uncomfortable circumstance. What are the people doing? Um, I think that um, PC Ria put up the picture of the house that I use so often, uh, just so you can look and see all the different benefits that are available. Uh, all of those things are available in every deal. In the first deal I talked to you about, the only benefit I got was income and yield because I made a loan, a wraparound loan, my IRA made a loan to those people. So she kept the growth in the house. She was, keep, she was holding the house, so she didn't take the profit. She kept the management of the house because she owned it. She, she used the house. She had the amortization on the underlying loan and she had the security of owning her home. I took income and yield for my benefit. The next transaction I talked about, I went to the lady and paid her $5,000 for an option to buy her house. She was able to keep her house. She was able to keep the use of the house. Tax benefits had it been a rental, but in this case, it was not a rental. She had uh, the income, which meant that she had a rental payment or a mortgage PITI payment that she could afford. The loan underneath it was amortizing and she got to stay in her home. All I got from that was the growth. Now, I might have structured that option so I got the growth and the amortization. But in the instance I'm talking to you about, I only got the growth. It's possible to get all these things, but all these things can be distributed. And so you, you have all the pieces available to make a deal without bringing anything except caring to, to the table. I spoke at Tampa Rhea, and some of you guys may have been there several years ago. Oh, good grief, several years ago. It was, it was a decade ago. And um, when I went there, I talked about no one wants cash. Value is subjective, very different for one person than it is to another. And everybody yawned through my entire presentation. And when I got done, some of the people heard me, none of them paid any attention, very few of them cared or listened. And then they went to what they call have wants. And some guy got up and he said, I got a rental house and I'm gonna sell my rental house. This was 2010. So the question I asked him was, why would you sell a nice house like this? And he explained that his daughter and and um, grandchildren needed a car. So he was gonna sell a good rental house to get a car for his daughter and grandkids because they kept breaking down and he was frightened for his daughter and his grandkids. Very natural for any parent to be in that situation and wanna help. But he was gonna sacrifice an entire house. And so I traded him my van for an option on the rental house. That enabled him to keep the rental house, keep the income that the rental house produced, gave me control of the growth, but I could not buy that house from him for 10 years. I traded in my van. I had to bum a ride home with someone at the meeting. No one heard a word I said, but they all remembered that I traded off my car and had no way to get home. Those are the kind of things that you do when you're an estate builder. You're always paying attention to value. 
uh, Adrian was talking about Matt Funk. Matt was over here at McDonald's and he was explaining to me that he was about to list a house for rent that had been for sale uh, for 500 and some thousand dollars and had not sold. So the lady had decided to rent it. Now this woman was in Europe, she was not here, but what did I hear Matt say? The person owned the house, wanted to sell it, was unable to sell it, was anxious and wanted to rent it to at least cover some of the expenses. So at McDonald's, I sat and wrote an offer right away. I would lease the house as long as I had the option to buy the house. Now, Matt and I were not able to get the deal done, but when I heard the opportunity, I took the action and wrote an offer. The writing of the offer was in an attempt to get a conversation started so I could discover what was going on in her life to motivate her to give up a nice house like that. Today, <clears throat> I got a telephone call and it was a friend of mine who's got a house that they're selling and the buyer is buying it and the buyer is qualified for a reverse mortgage. So to give you, make the numbers simple, a uh, $200,000 house, you can get a $100,000 reverse mortgage if you're old enough. And the reverse mortgage is payable with no payments, but with interest accruing. So this was attractive to this buyer because no payments was something they could afford. The problem was $200,000, the reverse, the max reverse is 50% is of that. So it was $100,000 uh, financing that he could get. The buyer had 50,000 cash. Problem, his house had not sold. And without the house selling, he couldn't cope with about $100,000 to use as a down payment so he could buy the house with the reverse for the other 100 and therefore have no payments in his new house. Now, with the realtors, with all the people that should have been able to put that together, no one took responsibility. They said, gee, the house hasn't sold. So therefore, the sale won't close. Your job is to structure so that the sale will close. So what happened was I said to the sellers of the house, carry a note for the other $50,000 on their home, on the buyer's home that's not yet sold, due and payable in one year or on sale of the house. That way you're not aggravating their payments. They're planning to sell a house, come up with the equity to convert it into the new house and they could make that deal and close right away. That's your job. It's to sit down, to listen, to care and structure something that will work. When you value things in dollars, you're making an intellectual mistake. The dollars are not what's going to make the deal. It's what those dollars are going to enable the other person to accomplish. I have a friend who's an incredible numbers guy and he's still kicking himself because in 2006, he missed the top of the market by about 3% when he sold his house. And he's still 15 years later, unhappy that he sold his house for $600,000 when if he had just moved two weeks earlier, he could have got $620,000. And when I said to him, I said, well, you know, why did you sell that nice house? He said, because my family needed a bigger house. So I said, well, what did you do with the money? He said, I bought the bigger house. I said, are you happier in the bigger house? Oh, yeah. Well, so what happened is he gave up a house that fitted him, fitted his family less well, and got one that he liked more. And instead of being unhappy about dollars, what the correct way of thinking is, is you look and you say, boy, I benefited my family by moving up to a better house.
Okay, I'm going to move myself and my iPad inside because I'd like you guys to really hear me without listening to the music next door. <laughs> Is there a party next door, Pete? Is that what you're saying? And you weren't invited? No, 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 no. I, it's not a party. It's just I got neighbors who really like music and they, they enjoy themselves out there. And so I'd rather not be bothering them. I just get out of the way and come back inside my house. I like people just fine, but I'm not much of a music guy, sadly. I heard you were a great dancer, though. Uh, no, I, I don't really don't dance. Remember I said I love people <laughs> and I like to help? If I yes. dance, someone's getting hurt. <laughs> Listen, can you make your camera so we see your whole face and not just like your eyebrows or your nostrils I, or something? I can't tell you. Um, okay, work on that. Is that better or worse? <laughs> I mean, I'm just tipping the iPad until you guys say okay. Yeah, no, I think that's that pretty good, deep. right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So I've just gone over a whole lot of different deals. I mean, three of those were done today. Um, some of you guys who've known me for a long time realize that sometimes one gets way too create, creative and courageous. And in uh, 1982, that was uh, my story. I bought 400 timeshares. Now, I don't know if you realize it, but 400 timeshares uh, can be a burden. <laughs> I bought them with no money down and no payments for 18 months. And then payments began at $23,000 a month. So, what was my job now that I've been foolish enough to be that aggressive? To get rid of them, to sell them. To, uh, to get rid of them, which does not mean to sell them. Now picture this, in 1982, I had 400 timeshares and I put them on the market for sale. How many would I have today? 395. Because selling is a, a bad way, a weak way, a poor way to move property. You need not to put up a sign and say a prayer that some buyer will come along who will buy a property. You've got to be proactive as an estate builder. You've got to go out and make a deal happen. So instead of being a seller, I became a buyer. And I went out and offered on every property I saw that I liked. I offered some timeshares as part of the acquisition of those properties that I wanted. So I became a very aggressive buyer. And 18 months after I made that deal, I had no timeshares left. All 400 timeshares were moved without giving away a single meal into properties I wanted, into paper that I liked, into things I didn't like, but I liked it better than owning a timeshare. The reason I'm thinking about that today is the very last of those timeshares that I traded into something is cashing out on Tuesday of next week, a partnership share that I traded my one of the timeshares for. So that was 1982. And the last 10 years, I've gotten $1,000 a year in income on that partnership share. And uh, next week I get about $10,000. If I had just waited and held those timeshares, waiting for them to sell, I would still have them. The $23,000 a month in mortgage payments would have made my life much less pleasant than it has been. It's so very important to become active in your estate building. I'm always explaining to people when I'm 
I'm doing kind of introductory talks at, at RIAs, that it all begins with caring, caring about yourself and caring about others. That's where I started when I talked to you about, I love people and want to help those people. I love myself, my family. I want to do good things for them. And so building an estate, getting enough assets to provide enough income so I was free was very important. But helping others was necessary to get me there. So caring both for others and for yourself is a first step. But uh, you know, Gary Johnson likes to say that investing is a team sport. Well, even more than investing is a team sport, estate building is a team sport. And so from my perspective, every single deal I have ever closed, the single most important thing I acquired in that transaction was the ally, the person I helped who became my friend and who referred other deals to me, made other deals for me, uh, carried financing to allow me to acquire a house, bought notes that I gave from people who were Democrats who thought they had to have cash. Uh, that, those relationships were so very important. In every case, if I look back, the relationship was more valuable than the asset I acquired in the deal. And so over and over and over again, after you care, you have to go out and learn how to do it. The way you learn is not with a book. It's not with a course. It's with finding people in your marketplace where you live who've been successful and taking them out to dinner. Buying the house next door to them so they have to deal with you. When I was a young real estate agent, I would buy notes at discount. I had an opportunity to buy a note, second, a second mortgage, because that's primarily what I was buying back then. And recognize we're talking about 1960s and very early 70s. So a, a three, four, five thousand dollar note was a good sized note. Uh, very unusual for me back when I started to get a note bigger than 10,000. But those notes often were a commission that was carried back by a broker. I could buy those notes. I could buy a note back in those days to yield 12%, which meant it would be sold at a discount. Or I could buy a note at par, get no discount, and get a yield of 6%. Over and over again, not always, but over and over again, I chose to get no discount because I wanted a relationship with the payor. And so when I bought a note, instead of buying a note at a discount that was paid by a school teacher who was undoubtedly gonna pay the $127 a month, I bought a note payable by an investor who had multifamilies, who was fixing and building and active in the community and I bought it with no discount. But what was I buying? Not just these $80 a month, but the introduction to that person. And so now my next step was when he sent me that check for $80 to communicate with him and say, gee, you know, instead of you sending me $80 every month, what about you just give me a piece of the deal? and we'll give up the debt if you can equity finance it. Now, rarely was I successful in making those deals, but always I made an impression by approaching them and making those offers. And I was able in my mid twenties to be invited into meetings of people in their fifties who spent 30 years getting there because purposefully I finagled my way in. When there was a hearing uh, for a variance, somebody wanted to put an additional apartment on a building, I never failed to be there to speak in favor of an investor who would invest in the community and build more. And people remembered that and met me and we sat down and bitched together about the bureaucrats. 
that's the way for you to build an estate is to get active, to build the relationships, build the allies, recruit the allies who will help you. When I made the deal, when I spoke for Gary Johnston out in Vegas, uh, my topic a few years ago was relationships and wealth building. And I was sitting here in my house uh, just making some notes and I was reviewing deals I've done with people and almost always when I'm speaking, when I'm teaching, I'm using the examples of cases from my history. And so I found that in my uh, 40 years at that point in real estate, I had done 71 transactions with four families. Now, when you think of how much easier and more efficient it was to do 71 deals with four families, rather than having to do 71 individual deals where you gotta go and establish a rapport, prove that you're competent and trustworthy, find out what it is that they're trying to accomplish and then help them. You will find that getting back to the people who you have done business with in the past, it should be a primary occupation of yours. When you sit down, if you ever have any spare time and you haven't talked to people you bought houses from or sold houses to, you should call those people. That is really important. Years ago, uh, well, many of you guys have heard me talk really with reverence about a guy named John Pochask, who was an old guy in his 40s when I was a young guy in my 20s, and he sold me a house. And the reason he sold me that, it was a triplex. The reason he sold it is, you see that picture of the house on, this, on your screen? The middle of it. Have you ever seen anybody who was tired of management? Management is far better than cash to make deals with investors. Because the reason people become investors is they want to have assets, buy them free time. And if they've got to spend their time managing those assets, it curtails that free time. So when I was 20 years old, I bought a triplex from John Pochask uh, by pr promising and recognize promise is the single most used currency in my world. All assets, all goods and services are currencies, are potentially currencies, but the promise is the easiest currency to use and it's something everyone can give. To the extent that you keep your promise, you'll find you can do business ever easier. Well, I promised John that I'd pay him $33,000 for the property on Roderick Avenue. The only problem was I was $33,000 light of the $33,000 he wanted for the house. Well, it turned out that he had a $21,000 first mortgage on it. So that brought me down to only being $12,000 light. And so I said, well, I'll give you $12,000 for your equity and take subject to the first mortgage if you'll take the $12,000 at $125 a month because I can rent the property, giving up the use of the property for income that I can use to pay John on the note. And so that's what we did because he sold me that property and I rented that property and people paid the rent. And so I could pay John on the note and I could pay the Beverly Cooperative Bank on the mortgage. John and I did 27 transactions in 30 years. And on top of that, he referred me many, many, many people that I did business with. When I moved to Florida, Years later, so this was 1980, actually, I'm sorry, when I moved from Tampa to uh, Pinellas in 1986, John saw that I'd moved and he sent me a check for $15,000 and said, you know, have some fun over there uh, in the, at the Florida beaches, here's $15,000, go buy some houses. 
and we'll split them 50-50. Oh boy. And, and so I want to, that came about because I made the deal with him in 1970, 15, 16 years earlier. And because we had been successful and enjoyed one another, had a, a fast friendship and alliance, he sent me the money. I went out and I bought a house in uh, Bonnie Bay. And I bought it back in the day for 7,000 cash. I negotiated a seller carry of $40,000 payable $400 a month for 100 months with no interest and took subject to a VA first mortgage, which was about 20. So now I made a, a good deal using someone else's money, using someone else's equity, I financed it at 0% with the seller. And using someone else's credit, I took subject to the VA. The only issue was back then in 1986, my kids were eight, nine, 10, 11. I wanted to spend more time with them and more time interfering in their lives. And I wanted to coach basketball while they were still only 10 and I could beat them. And so what I did is I called Dennis Kelsch, who's a friend of mine over here. I said, Dennis, I got this house in Bonnie Bay. It's a really nice three bedroom, two bath, two car garage house. If I gave you 25% of it, would you do all the management? And so Dennis took on the management. So now I use John's money. I used the seller's equity. I used the seller's credit and Dennis's management. And what did I do? I watched. Now, when I was younger, I wouldn't have given up the management. I'd have done that work myself because I would have wanted the, the return on that work, which would have been another, which would have doubled the amount of equity I had in that house. But I'm just trying to show you how the pieces are there to build transactions. Now, many of you have heard me talk about uh, subject two, and I avoid subject two pretender lender loans. I pursue subject to human being loans. I consider subject to institutional loans where they're portfolio lenders. And I go to a credit union and go talk to a real person. So let's take you back to 1995 and talk about a subject to deal. In 1995, I bought a house that had a uh, fleet mortgage. I don't know if any of you guys would remember fleet, but fleet was a, an institutional lender way back when. And in 95, there was a 10% mortgage on this property. I bought the property for $435 down and took title subject to a $40,000, 10% mortgage payable to fleet 450 per month. See, I can't tell because I don't hear or see anybody. Uh, I'm hoping that I'm not just talking to no one and that people are, are hearing uh, what I'm saying. But in any case, I bought it subject to, despite the fact there was an institutional debt. The reason I bought it was because it was so very little money to take it subject to, and because I could rent the house for 750 a month. At 750 a month back then, 40% vanished to taxes, insurance, maintenance, supplies, cleaning, advertising. And so the property would pay for itself. Now, that mortgage paid down. And over the next three years, it had paid down from $40,000 to $35,000. It's still 10% which was high, not as high as it sounds today, because now we're talking about 1999. So what happened was I had, remember uh, Alex talking about Advanta? I had a friend who had an IRA. And so I said to uh, my friend, 
does your IRA have $35,000 in it? And it did. And I borrowed $35,000 at 8% from the IRA with payments of four fifty a month. So I didn't increase my cash flow. But what did I increase? I increased my safety by getting rid of an institution and replacing it with a human being who was a friend of mine. So now I'm still making the same four fifty a month payment. And so I've replaced the institution. I'm paying a friend, a person that I've done other business with who I know well. And I'm still paying 400 a month. Well now 400 a month on a $35,000 balance with only an 8% rate instead of a 10% rate did what? It escalated the mortgage pay down. And so in 2003, the mortgage balance was $25,000. And when it got to $25,000, I got talking to another person who had a Roth IRA. And do you know she was 52 years old? That was important because at 52 years old with a Roth IRA, she was seven and a half years away from taking any withdrawals from the IRA. So what did that mean? That meant that she was not going to need the money. She wanted the yield. She wanted the return. So I borrowed $25,000 from her IRA to pay off my other friend's IRA and stopped paying four fifty dollars a month and replaced it with no payments. Now, can anybody think of why no payments might be better than 450 a month payments? Made my deal safer, cash flowed better, but I owed 8% on $25,000 with no payments. At the end of the first year, I owed $27,000 because the interest had accrued. And so we wrote the note at was 8% with no payments for seven and one half years. So in seven and one half years, the mortgage balance was back up to $40,000, a little over $40,000 at the time. And then payments began at $400 a month and started coming back down because now she was 59 and a half and she could take that $400 tax free and spend it to subsidize her lifestyle. So that was a structure we had. So lo and behold, several years went by and in 2013, we've been making payments now of uh, $400 a month after having made no payments for seven and a half years. We got a telephone call, the mortgage balance was back uh, up into the uh, high 30s at the time. And it was the lady whose IRA we, we borrowed the money from. And she said, I've got an additional $44,000 in my IRA. I would like you to borrow. And so this was 2014. Now recognize we made this deal in 95. And we're still working with this property. And she's, I'd like you to borrow the $44,000. I said, wait a minute, why do you have $44,000? I thought you were going to spend the money when you got to be 59 and a half. She said, well, so did I, but I'm still working. I like my job. I don't need the money. So I haven't taken the money out and it's compounding in my IRA. Or actually it's accruing in my IRA because it wasn't invested in anything. And so... She said, I'd like you to borrow the $44,000. I said, well, I really don't need it. She said, I don't care. And so we borrowed another $44,000, bringing the loan up to $65,000. At that point in time, we increased our payment from $400 to $500. 
And in 2019, we got another phone call from her. And she said, I've got another $37,500. I want you to borrow it. And I said, well, I really don't need it. She said, I don't care. And so I borrowed it, bringing the loan balance to $96,500 and increasing our payment, still at 8%, to $750 per month. Now, we've got a house that is rented for $1,000 a month, and we got a $750 payment. So that house generates a negative cash flow with that payment. Why does that make sense for us? Because you remember back in 2014, when she advanced an additional $44,000, what did we do with that $44,000? We bought three more houses in 14. And those houses are rented. And then in 2019, when she advanced another $38,000, we didn't buy any more houses, but in 19, we put new roofs and new windows and new kitchens and we improved some of the houses we had. But in both cases, we generated more income and acquired more and better property. So though there's $96,000 in debt on a little house that only rents for a thousand bucks, the debt was not attributable to that house. It's debt that was used to acquire more houses and to improve other houses. So now we're paying $750 a month until we fully amortize $96.5 at 8%. How long is that going to take? <laughs> well, say, let's say 25 years. That's 25 years beginning in 2019. So how long will it be before it's reduced to zero unless we do something else? So let's say it's 2020, make it easier. You add 25 to that, it's gonna be 2045. Was that a long-term investment? Yes, but each step there was done on purpose to accomplish something. And so doing things on purpose is next step after you learn how to do business you have to act and you have to act and act again when i was at john Schaub's class a few years ago uh, a young woman in the class said to john uh you know how long did you and pete study before you were ready to buy your first property and John answered her, and I think he answered her exactly correctly. She said, he said, what Pete and I had in common was not study, was not smart. It was we were brave, and we pulled the trigger. So after the caring and after the learning comes the action, and you have to pull the trigger. Once you act and you acquire things, you're going to always act because you feel a lack, just like every other human being. You act in order to improve your situation, to improve the situation of people who you love. And so when you make a deal, you give up something in return for something you like better. The problem is, since we're all human, sometimes you're right and sometimes you're wrong. So I can look back at, a, at deals that I say today, I wish I hadn't done that. But the fact is, I've been correct more often than I've been wrong. And I haven't stopped because I was wrong. I just hopefully learned something from being wrong. That leads us to the final part of estate building. You certainly need to develop the relationships. You need to care, you need to learn, need to act, but you absolutely must persevere. People wrongly say to me, you're smart. What they're really seeing is I'm old. Properties I bought in 1970, 
I still have. And that is a very, very, very important part of state building. You acquire assets and you keep them. Your job is to acquire inflation hedged, income producing assets. Let them pay for themselves and then pay for your lifestyle to acquire income producing inflation hedge assets and keep them. Now, that was easier. And I promised Liz not to go crazy with the politics tonight, uh, but you guys didn't <laughs> help me with the business of the governor saying, forget contract law, it doesn't apply. I have guns and I'm telling you, you cannot enforce your contract. So that's not a healthy thing. But do realize that when I began in 1965, essentially property rights and contract law was honored. Today, we've got a government that has murdered an economy, taken 3% unemployment and turned it into 15% unemployment in a simple three months, and is now saying you cannot enforce contracts you sign. So promises that you've made and you've accepted from other people are much less sacred today and that makes it more dangerous to do this business now for me with other assets where i can scheme it's one thing but for the person who's getting started whose primary currency is going to be promises those promises work well because people understood that you would keep your promises the fact that government is saying today, people do not need to keep their promises. And we get to say who gets to use your house means it's much more dangerous to be an estate builder starting with very, very little. Now what makes it not dangerous is since you're starting with very little, you're risking very little. But from my perspective, I will sell a house and sell it at a low price as long as I've got the right to buy it back and I've recorded a mortgage to give me that right because I'm giving up the thrill of management, the use of the house, some income from that house, but I'm controlling the growth in value and perhaps the equity because I might indeed sell it for low market. An example, uh, some of you guys know where I live out here in Madeira Beach on a sandbar. And my house is a 1950s house. Um, and I've lived here since 95. And so that means at least since 95, there have been no improvements. And so it's still very much a 1950s house. I had a gentleman come out and um, offer me uh, $700,000 for this house. It was a, a realtor, I'm sorry, not a gentleman, a realtor came to my door and said, I've got a buyer who'd like to buy your house and he'll offer you $700,000. I said, well, I really don't need $700,000. I'll be happy to sell it to him for $500,000 as long as I have the right to buy it back in a decade for the same $500,000. And the realtor was a little confused by that counter offer because usually expected counter offers to be asking for more rather than reducing the price by 200,000. And he said, but, 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 but I said, well, no, listen, I'm going to trade him my house for his money. As long as in 10 years, I can return his money and he'll return my house. And she said, but he's going to tear your house down and build a giant house on the lot. And I said, well, that's okay with me. I'll still do that. I was not able to make that deal. You'll notice I'm still sitting here in the 1950s house on the water. But that's the kind of thing you should be doing at all times. 
when you get an offer, you don't just say no. It drives me crazy when somebody says, my client was insulted by your offer. You should never be insulted by an offer. You should always encourage an offer. See what you can trade for. Because what happens is, if I get an offer, like my friend who missed the chance to sell his house for $620,000, he only got 600 because he waited a month too long. If that 600, though it's a lower offer, enables me to buy something I like better, I should accept it in order to buy something I like better because my job is to buy things I like better. If I have a pool house, I will trade it for a non-pool house because I'm afraid of the risk and the liability of a pool. If it were my son, he would trade for a pool because he would enjoy the use of the pool. And that's just human beings who are different and like things differently. When I was a residential real estate agent, which I failed miserably at, by the way, I was fired by my very last house buying client. When I said to the lady, what can you do in a blue bathroom you cannot do in a pink bathroom? But the reason that I got so <laughs> frustrated as to say that was because we found a house that was where it should be, right schools, right job, right amount of income, all the things she needed, right monthly payments, right square footage, convenient to her schools and churches, but she didn't like the color of the bathroom. And I was so incensed by that that I lost my cool, mentioned to her that perhaps it would be worthwhile to enamel the bathroom uh, and, and lost a client. My career in real estate has been focused on building results, making transactions on purpose, that would enable me to better myself and my family and at the same time help the people who are sitting across the table from me. I bought a house last summer for $261,000. The lady got an offer after we had contracted to buy the house. You know the way sometimes uh, people hear that uh, a property sells, they say, oh, I would have paid you more than that. You know, like people just, just just have to say that. So uh, her son called me and said, you know, mom got an offer after, um, after we told our neighbors that we'd sold the house. One of the neighbors offered her a half a million dollars. Now, does anybody remember what my price was? $261,000. So when he called and told me that, I said, listen, I will withdraw from the transaction and let your mother take the half a million dollars. Because that extra quarter million dollars was life changing to that older lady. And I can do another deal. And so I canceled the contract. And the buyer, the next door neighbor, didn't buy the house. They were talking. It was fine. Said, oh, yeah, I'd give you half a million. But in the end, they sold, they came back to me, sold the property to me. We closed, of course, at, at Sue Ann Lewis's office, Gulfside Title Hill, where I closed almost all my deals. And as we walked from the office, this very nice lady said to me, listen, I got one more thing to ask of you. And I said, what's that? She said, please never sell this house to the next door neighbor. And so I promised that I wouldn't. Those are the kind of things that absolutely change lives and change what you can accomplish in the world. My transactions to this day, uh, I'm 73 years old. I started doing this when I was 18. My primary currency is still promises. And because I have kept my promises over the years, the repeat and referral business continue 
to bring me more deals, more opportunities. Think for a minute about the people with whom you've done a good deal. I would bet that they like you and you like them. That time you spend getting to know people is so very important and so profitable for those of you who are concerned about building wealth. All the benefits on this house you see in front of you are available in every single deal. They're all there. Now, the businessman will try to buy the house lower so he can sell it and make a profit because that's the, that's the income he wants. The investor will buy it to rent to produce income in the form of monthly cash flow because that's the income he wants. The investor gets the benefit of depreciation, so there's tax benefits as additional income. So I can sell a house to a businessman, a flipper, to raise the cash if it'll enable me to buy a house that I like better. Liking it better may mean it rents better, may mean it's on a better lot, so I believe it'll appreciate better and it'll have more growth than the house I give up. And so giving the profit up to a businessman so that I can get a better house for me makes me not feel at all bad about the profit I gave up because I'm focused not on what I gave up, but on what I received. I had multifamily houses when I was in college. That's what I, that's what I invested in. I bought a triplex. I bought four triplexes and two fourplexes uh, while I was in college. Those properties I later traded into single family houses. When I traded the multis into the single family houses, what did I change mostly? I hate the fact I can't hear you guys, so I don't know whether <laughs> make me any impression at all. But in any case, in my perception, I gave up the management. I went to single family houses where I had a tenant who was taking care of the house, who was managing it, which gave me more time with my wife and my children. And that benefit of more free time with Gene and the kids was crucial. That was a of such value that I didn't mind sacrificing the quote gross income in favor of the free time. Those are the kinds of decisions people make all of the time. And that's why you have to talk to them and find out what's going on. I can't tell you how many times I've made great deals with people who I liked and who liked me. When I had 33 houses, I was 35 years old. So when I got out of high school, I had no houses. When I was 33, uh, Gene and I had four kids and we had 33 rentals. At that point in time, our goal was to spend more time with our children because the children were going to school at that point. And so we had to make sure we were there to overcome the bad influences they ran into in schools. And so we boiled our portfolio down over almost a two year period from 33 rentals to 22 better single family houses that required less management, had less debt, and we invested in a portfolio of $300,000 in mortgages. And we did that specifically to provide us with $100 a day in income, cash flow from the mortgages. So that $100 a day, now this was 1982, that $100 a day paid our bills. It enabled us to to do what we wanted to do with our children, which meant we didn't have to take anything from the houses. We were able to leave the houses alone and let them grow up. 
we spent the $100 each and every day. That $100 a day ran that $300,000 mortgage portfolio down to $85,000 in 1995. So that meant that in that 12 years while our kids were in school, we spent $215,000 of our capital on lifestyle. We did that on purpose. We spent $215,000 of capital on lifestyle. And we spent all of the interest. So we were able to do the things with our children that we wanted to do. Then, in 1995, when our kids were launched, I had $85,000 in paper left over that was paying me $1,450 a month. I traded that residual paper back into real estate. The real estate was a nice three bedroom, two bath house over here in Pinellas. It was rented for $7.95 a month. I traded the paper for the property because the property was inflation hedged income producing. The gentleman, the older gentleman I traded with was thrilled to get the paper. He had no risk of management. It had been paid for years and years and years. He loved having $1,450 a month more income. The average yield on my paper was 9% back in the day. He was moving up to Bardmore to live with his uh, daughter or son and, uh, and grandkids. And the extra income and the, uh, the in-law apartment was wonderful for him. We got that house. Our income went from $14.95 a month to $350 a month because we had $7.95 in rent coming in, but we had taxes, insurance, maintenance, supplies, cleaning. So it was a big hit in terms of spendable income. But that house, we still have. When we traded in 95 for that house at 85,000, which was probably a retail price. What happened? In 95, we got the house. It was worth 85. In 2005, that same house was worth almost $200,000. In 2010, it was back to $85,000. Today, it's something like $250,000. None of that is relevant to us. What's important is that house, which was rented for $795, is now rented for $1,795. And it helped produce income to fund our life. That's another example of purposeful, long-term thinking, seeing these benefits and applying them to the people it helped. When I gave that gentleman that mortgage, it gave him the income that he treasured and he gave me the house with the growth of that house and with the inflation hedge rents. In uh, 2004, I went to see a gentleman as a referral, not a person I'd ever known. And I said to him, why would you sell a nice house like this? And he said, I hate it here. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, I grew up in Miami. I hate it here in St. Petersburg. I said, well, it's a nice place. How long have you been here? He said, oh, almost a week. I said, well, you might want to give it a chance. <laughs> he said, no, 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 I want to go back to Miami. My friends and all the things I know are in Miami. I want to go home. So now my next question, my next discovery, I know he wants to give up this house. He had just bought the house for $188,000 in cash. And so I said to him, well, in the event that you go back to Miami, where are you going to live? Because in the event 
that he doesn't have a house. What do I have to do? Make the payments? I have to help him get a house. See, because what happens is no one wants the money. They, when people say, I want to sell my house and get cash, what do they want it for? They want it for the car, like the gentleman at Tampa Rhea. They want it to pay off debt, like the lady with the credit card debt. Uh, they want it to pay off medical bills. Often they want it to buy another house because they need another house wherever they're going. When they need it to buy another house, does that mean you have to have cash? No, it doesn't. It means you have to be able to enable them to get another house. So had he not had another house, my job would have been to structure a deal so I got his house and enabled him to have a place to live. But instead, he said, oh, no, I kept my house in Miami when I moved here. I still own it. And so he's, I'm, I want to move back to it. I said, well, in the event that I bought your house and gave you your $188,000 back, what are you going to do with the money? He said, oh, my bank pays 4%. Now, this was a long time ago. Banks aren't doing that anymore. But I said, wow, you own a bank? <laughs> and he laughed and said, no, no, my bank, the place where I always bank. And I said, gee, 4%. I said, you know, when I was in elementary school, I learned that more is better. In the event that I would agree to pay you 5%, is there any reason why you wouldn't rather have 5% than 4%? And he financed that property. I paid the closing costs. And he financed $188,000 at 5% for 10 years, interest only, to match whatever that CD was, which was going to be at 4%. And so that was fine. I was happy buying the house for that. But the balloon was something that bothered me. And so once we closed on the house, and not before, because it was a good enough deal, I contacted him and said, you know, I really am worried about the balloon. I can't see the future that clearly. I'd like to make bigger payments. And he ignored me. And he ignored me. And then one day I got a letter from him because, of course, he was back in Miami. And it seemed that he had paid attention when I said to him, don't tell me what you won't do. Tell me what you will do so I can try to help. He sent me a letter. I mean, I still, I, I, I actually have a copy of that handwritten letter, which often I give out and show in my paper course, because it's so funny to see somebody who actually sat down and, and wrote back to me. And he said, uh, dear Mr. Fortuna, you said, don't tell me what I won't do, tell you what I will do. This is what I will do. I'm in my 70s and I will accept $2,000 a month until I die. And at the time of my death, you'll have the property free and clear. Or I'll just finance it at 5% for 15 years. So I sat down with my son because Jay really likes this house. And Jay said, well, surely the man's in his middle 70s. He'll die before 15 years are up and we'll own the house cheaper oh. that way. And I said, no, no, oh, no, my we're goodness. investors. We want predictable, we don't want risk. And so we made the deal at 5% for 15 years. And that loan balance today is $53,000 and there are three years left on that note. You know, Pete, um, this kind of, I don't know why, but this reminded me of uh, when I went to your paper course this last year, you told a story, and I think, Adrian, we have the paper on it. Um, it was the one called Too Far Away. Do you remember that one, Pete? Oh, yeah. Where very the people often were. That, very often that's a problem. 
Yeah, I think that would be a great one for people to know. They may never have heard of someone using that kind of a strategy. Um, Adrian, can you put that paper up? I think we have it, and then folks can see it as Pete talks about that. Oh, that. <laughs> right. now, oh, that's no. a, that, now, now, recognize, uh, you know, David Tilney, who you had on here, is a friend. I have some friends in Colorado, so I have a further reach than many people would have. But we made an offer years and years and years ago for a property in New Hampshire, which had been on the market for a long period of time, and it hadn't sold. And so when I made the offer to buy the house and give them a note for this vacant house, I was sure they would accept it. And I was very surprised when they said no. And what happened when I said, well, why wouldn't you rather have a note than have a house that's 1400 miles away? They said, well, what happens is if you don't pay, if you got run over by a truck, we are 1,400 miles away from the property, and we got to come back out there and bail it out. And so I said, in the event that I gave you a note secured by something in Colorado that's close to you, is there any reason why you wouldn't make that deal if I gave you collateral closer to home? And so what you see here on the page is the example that I gave them of using a house in Colorado as security for the note that I gave to buy a house in New Hampshire. And for many people, collateral closer to home makes them more comfortable. Or sometimes it's not collateral, sometimes you're trading them a property. Years ago when I was a real estate agent, I was doing a lot of investment stuff. We had a friend up in Boston uh, who came down to the uh, Red Sox game. The Red Sox used to uh, train in Winter Haven, I think. And so Ed and Carol used to come down every year and rent a place and go watch the Red Sox practice playing baseball. Now, to some people, that, that would be just painful. But they really enjoyed it. So when he retired, he decided to sell a five unit apartment building that he had. And I sold it to a young couple. The young couple bought the property because Ed and Carol no longer wanted the management and in their retirement, they wanted more free time. Obviously when they were willing to travel to Florida to watch a baseball team practice, uh, they wanted a quiet life. So in any case, I sold the house for them and they carried a mortgage. The most important part of that sale was the freedom that it bought him. So then I came down to Florida to a Florida real estate exchange was meeting. And at the meeting, somebody said, my client has a house in Winter Haven, a little cottage. And her husband has passed away. She has moved back to Michigan to be near her family. So when I heard that, I said, gee, my client has a note and a mortgage, which is a good note and mortgage, which paid back then was probably eight or 9%, uh, which had monthly payments. And so I said, my client will trade the note and mortgage for the house in Winter Haven subject obviously to his inspection. And the, the broker said, well, I'll take the note and mortgage information to my client. So when I went back to Boston, I called Ed and I said, gee, Ed, do you still get payments from Barry on that note? And, and he said, well, as a matter of fact, I do. I said, boy, are those payments uh, really important to your lifestyle? And he said, not really, but it's so much better than having to own the apartments. I'm so thrilled with the way. I said, well, so those payments are still coming in, but they're not real important to you, huh? And he said, all right, what did you do now? And I said, well, in the event that I could show you how to use that note mortgage to have a free and clear cottage in Winter Haven near where the Red Sox train, is there any reason why you wouldn't do that? And lo and behold, he did that. The lady in Michigan had an income stream with great payers. 
secured by a five unit apartment building with plenty of rent to make the mortgage payments. And Ed had a house in an area he traveled to regularly every single year to vacation. Those are things that happen because you pay attention to what other people want and like. And if you be someone like me who just delights in interfering, you can interfere to the benefit of people. The deal you see in front of you, the too far away, that distance thing can make some people feel very, very uncomfortable. Other times, we, we just give people more equity. An example of that is I had a broker really take advantage of me over here in Pinellas County. I had no idea that she was as accomplished a schemer as it turned out she was. She called me one day <laughs> and she said, you know, I've got a client who wants to sell a house, but even you couldn't talk her into carrying financing because the example she, the, 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 the happening she has in her life regarding seller carry was so dreadful that she'll never do it again. She said, three years ago, I sold her house for $65,000. The person put down $3,000 and my client carried a $62,000 mortgage. The buyer never made a payment not the first payment ever. The buyer lived in the house, was foreclosed after two years, and then had to be evicted because he refused to move from the house. So needless to say, this lady will never carry financing again. So I said, well, give me your name and number. And I called her up. And I met with the lady and I bought the house for $65,000, no money down, gave her a promise. But I gave her the promise secured by a first mortgage on a quarter of a million dollar house. So if I hadn't paid, what would she have foreclosed on? A quarter million dollar house rather than 65. And for some people, more equity makes them much more comfortable. And I thought that I was showing that realtor that indeed you could still negotiate. What she was showing me is she knew that I could go make a deal with a tenant, with a, a client of hers who she really let down with a bad deal. And indeed I did buy that house. But it was funny to realize afterwards that I'd been set up by that lady when she sent me to meet her client. <laughs> oh my gosh. That, you know, when I went to your class, I saw that one. Uh, I remember that one on finished property. That's kind of like you're, you're giving more, uh, something to make the seller feel more secure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, you, you there it the is. It's up there. We, we actually the have that course. one there. I know, I can't help it. <laughs> it was so good. I mean, everything you do is awesome. How can I, uh, I just try to remember all these things. It's so many, the but this is a good one here too, right, Pete? The big thing you learn with these is the t -box. You just let people see, here's your options, and you choose the side you like better. In the example that, that you're looking at, there's a house on Blaine Avenue, a fourplex on Blaine Avenue. It was a very exciting deal because it was a, a two-story uh, fourplex with two apartments above two apartments. And I was selling it. Um, and right before the closing, the refrigerator in the second floor apartment fell through the floor into the first floor apartment, which made the buyers really nervous. And so I um, had the buyers give a mortgage on a duplex that it was their first rental house they'd ever bought that they'd renovated very, very nicely and therefore get the fourplex delivered with a ton of equity in it so that they could borrow the money to do the major rehab that it required. My client got, got safe 
very rentable, nice condition duplex instead of a house that needs a lot of work. Somebody's listening. I got two text messages about that story. So that, that was cool. <laughs> Yes, no, they're listening, man. Everybody's like absorbing it. <laughs> reading the deal, Pete. We're reading the deal. I see. <laughs> this is awesome stuff, Pete. Well, is that it? I, does anybody have any questions or no? I have a question from, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes ago. Yeah. And it's something I've heard you say over and over about keeping up with the people that you bought a property from, basically keeping up with anyone. Yeah. And I have been working on keeping up people that I bought properties from or that owner financing. At this moment, it's just kind of keeping conversation alive instead of not talking to them. But is there something more that I should be going towards to do 71 deals with them throughout my life? Yeah, you're, or is, you're, is there, what should I be doing? What's the next step besides just saying, hey, how are you? You ask for, you're asked for help. I, when I call a person and say, you know, I'm really happy with your house. Thank you very much. I'm looking for another house. Do you know anybody? What do they say? So they say, well, gee, I got another property. Or they say, gee, I know Sam down the block. But if I don't ask the question, one of my, one of my favorite stories, because it's the one that no one believes, with all the weird stuff I've done, the biggest story that I tell is about my fifth property I ever owned. I bought the property for $50,000. Now, remember, we're talking 1970. It was a fourplex, $50,000. Why would they sell a nice house like that? Management. They lived in the fourplex. Their children were growing up. They wanted to buy a single family house. Can everybody relate to that? They were going to move out of the yeah. four bucks. They wanted to buy a single family house. So what did they expect to do? Sell the fourplex, get 50,000 in cash, take the 50,000 in cash and buy a house. So what did they actually want? Was they wanted a single family house with a yard in the city of Beverly where I live. Now, I didn't have a house. Actually, I didn't have $50,000 in total equity at that point in my life. But what could I give them for? I could give them a promise. So I said to them, I understand that you guys have jobs. You're wage slaves. So you're the, among the, the, the privileged who can get the very best financing in the whole wide world. I'm an unemployed real estate agent who has rental properties that no one will give me any uh, credit based on the income from the rents. So I can't help you get cash for the house. But if you'll buy the house you want, and I've never been able to do this except when people have identified a house they want and they don't want to lose it. I will make the payments for you. So what happened is with $10,000 down, they were able to buy a $50,000 house because with 20% down, they could get conventional financing. Everybody understand that one? So yeah. if got they it. got an 80% loan, that was $40,000. And back in the day, that was a 7.5% 30-year loan. So 7.5% 30 years has a payment of how much a month? 
$280, okay? $280, this is only a $40,000 loan. So what could I do? I could agree to give them a first mortgage on their fourplex, payable at seven and a half percent interest, $280 a month until paid, so I could make the payments for them. I couldn't give them the 40 grand, but I could give them the payments on the 40 grand. And by matching those mortgage payments, I could help them get that house. The only problem was they needed 10,000 down and I didn't have $10,000. So I went to my tenant. Now we're finally getting back around to Adrian's question about what do you say to people that you've done business with? My tenant in my second house I'd ever bought had money in the Beverly Cooperative Bank. And back then, the bank was paying 3%. And the bank had agreed to lend to investors in those days at 9%. So I went to see my tenant who had $10,000 in the bank. And I said, gee, can you imagine the bank would lend to an investor at 9%? How much are they paying you on that money you've got there? And she said, well, they were only paying me 3%. I said, well, gee, you know, I'd rather pay 9% to you than pay it to the bank. Why don't we take the bank out of the equation? So she took the $10,000 out of the bank, lent it to me. I used that as the down payment to buy the fourplex. I paid her $75 a month interest only on $10,000, which was better than the $25 a month she was getting. The only reason I made that deal was because I knew, as my tenant, I knew she had money in the bank because I'd had her application. I had been in touch with her for almost two years that she'd been my tenant. I had rapport with her. She believed in me. I believed in her. I knew that if I paid extra money to her, it made her easier for her to pay my rent. And so I borrowed from my tenant in my second building the down payment I needed to buy my fifth building. I enabled the people selling the, my fifth building, which was a fourplex, to buy the single family house they wanted to live in using $10,000 I got from my tenant by promising to pay them 9% and by promising the seller of the fourplex $280 a month $40,000 at 7.5% in return for their house so that they could buy the single family house they wanted to buy. That involved communication, caring, listening, talking to other people. Thank you. Pete, <laughs> Pete we have a couple of questions um, that I want to bring to your attention, okay, on the yeah. side. So, one is from Dory. She's asking you, Pete, what if the seller is willing to take back financing but not long-term enough to cash flow the rental? In the event that she was willing to carry mortgage uh, for a reasonable rate, a better rate than I could get elsewhere, I might give her other collateral and sell the property I got from her and just use it as a way to raise cash to pay off. For example, if I had institutional debt, I would do that and suffer the risk of the balloon. I mean, assuming it wasn't crazy short. Um, so I might give other collateral and sell the property as a rate, way to raise cash and refinance or refinance my property. What I might also do is say, what, what do you expect the future to bring? And most people are going to tell you honestly, they don't have any idea. And so in that case, anytime I'm going to sign a balloon, I'm going to negotiate up front an extension that says in the event that I can't refinance to pay you off, we will do the following. And 
that could be I'll double the payment to extend the loan. It could be I'd pay down a tiny amount of principal. It could be I'd increase the interest rate by a point or something. But I would negotiate some kind of an extension or I might not do that deal. See, this is hard, not having people but, say, the hell you say, or what <laughs> if, you know, I, 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 not hearing anything back, I just hope there's actually someone out there. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I actually was talking to you, but I was muted, I muted myself. <laughs> yeah. I've been there many times in the last couple of months. Oh my gosh. Hey, listen, Pete, uh, Nia has a question for you, I think it's interesting. She's saying for a first investment, just after a divorce, rebuilding a new life and if you were new at this would you buy a duplex or a single family home as a first investment that's a question and she's saying that she would have 20 percent down payment for the conventional loan if she went that direction what would you advise someone in her position uh, well not not knowing about what kind of skills and what kind of manager she has I think that the, the plexes are Let's not, say she was new at it. Let's say she's new at it, okay? Right. I think plexes are not a good investment. Talk about that. Having tenants that rub up against one another every day almost guarantees you short-term tenants and conflict. Now, you know you're making all the multifamily people on here uh, flip a heartbeat right there, right? Well, that just means they got to, you know, you guys know Jeannie Stosser. She's a very good friend of John Schaub's and I mean, a very good friend. We, yeah. We, we've grown yeah. old together, but Jeannie believes in apartments and she can manage them well and she's got all those right skills. But I will tell you, multifamily requires a level of skill that I don't have. I can acquire a house and put a really nice family in it and they'll stay for years and years. The last plex I had was a triplex that I actually bought from one of my friend's client because my, my friend's a CPA and his client was getting killed uh, worrying about his tenants. And I bought a triplex, this was 30 years ago. Um, every one of the tenants in that triplex was a great kid, all in their late twenties. Uh, took very good care of the property, uh, took care of the yard, barbecued out together. Uh, the place looked good. The tenants paid the rent. They were nice, nice, nice people. So I was lulled into buying a, a plex, even though I know better than to do that. I bought the triplex. It worked well for almost three months. Then the young woman, decided that she was going to betray me and get married and move out. The lady in the middle apartment moved in with her new husband, leaving me with a vacant apartment. I rented it to a really nice couple who were retired, who moved down from New York, upstate New York. They moved into the the middle unit in the triplex. The first day they were in there, about, it was getting late, like eight o'clock at night. I got a telephone call. The music is so loud, call the tenant beside us and tell her to turn her music down. What was happening was, there were, every one of the persons in that triplex was a nice person. If they were in their own house, I could deal with it. But when they are rubbing up against one another, the 70 year olds didn't hit it off with the 28 year old. And so those kinds of things I'm not good at and I'm not willing to take on. So for me, I'm buying single family houses in really nice neighborhoods. And I don't care, I'm not as much of, uh, it's gotta be a great house as I am, it's gotta be a great neighborhood. 
Now, that said, I have talked to two people this year, and this may be right up the alley of this uh, woman who's just asked this question. I've talked to two people this year who sold their houses and just cashed them out, code section 121, no tax. They just sold them and had the money as they've gotten older. And they bought a duplex and they moved into one side of the duplex. And both of them told me they shined the other side and then furnished it and has been, they've been vacation renting them. And it gives them something to do in their retirement and gives them more income and gives them a social life. And so that's only two people, but it is still two people I've talked to in the last 12 months. And that was not a story I had heard until this last 12 months. And that might be something that might fit if you're in an area where you know that the vacation renting is going to be something that you're allowed to do. And see, out here in Madeira Beach, if you're on Gulf Boulevard, that's okay. But if you get back into the neighborhoods, the, the neighbors raise, raise cane with you, you can get into some regulatory things that might make your plans of vacation rentals uh, not doable. So I'd be cautious of that. But I have talked to those two guys in the past year I, I know many, many people who bought uh, duplex, triplex. Actually, my son and daughter-in-law have a fourplex up in uh, New Hampshire where uh, they have rentals and they have a place to live and they come and go between Florida and uh, New England um, and it works very nicely for them. So the key is going to be how good a deal can you make? Um, you say, uh, uh, the, the, the questioner said uh, she's going through a divorce. Uh, does she know yeah. any old people? If she knows an old oh. person, she might indeed get, get that old person to get a reverse mortgage on a property. And she might move in there and pay some rent on a really nice place and live way above her means. Well, that actually brings up something that Keith is asking over here. He's saying, how do you present an offer to someone who is free and clear, but is about to initiate a reverse mortgage? How do you present an offer that would be better? Why would you present an offer that would be better? Why wouldn't you just borrow their money? There you go. Now, I've got two friends over here who borrowed on reverse mortgages uh, let's just say $200,000. And actually that's lower than one of them, but $200,000, it's going to cost them 5% uh, accruing. So no payment. And they then made loans at six and 8% that give them cash flow. So they've got 1600 a month coming in and no more payment going out. And so they've in increased their cash flow. Now, Keith, so I, I saw a note on the top of my iPad saying they're going to use the money to pay off credit cards. Well, that means that yeah. money is being used at maybe a, a 15, 18, 25% yield. It's going to be hard to beat that yield. But depending on the size of the credit card, I might indeed buy an option on that house, enabling them to pay off the credit card or even buy a remainder interest in that house so they could remain in the house and get rid of their debt. The problem would be if they're, if they're gonna run up the credit cards again and get into trouble, you may not be giving them the help that they need. I, uh, I think I, I may have mentioned it on here, but I, I was at McDonald's and that young guy had the uh, $400 a month payment on his car and I offered to pay the car off in return uh, for an option on a house that I was going, that he was going to buy. That would be something that uh, I might very well do. I've got a, a lady over here who's got a waterfront house with quite a large uh, reverse mortgage on it. 
But now what's happened with taxes have gone up and the insurance have gone up. And even with no payment on the reverse, it's straining her in her retirement. And so I am strongly considering, and I've talked with her now twice about having my IRA pay her taxes and pay her insurance every year in exchange for the remainder interest in the house. So one day I end up, my IRA ends up with a, uh, a waterfront property here in Pinellas County. So I'm giving up income now for growth over a period of time. Well, good stuff. That um, I think, um, Adrian, uh, can you put up the, the one paper that I sent you that says, why would hungry heirs carry a note? Again, it's your paper course, Pete. I can't help it. But here, you, you remember this one? Um, I know you had a series of these that would, the reason I'm, I'm bringing this up is because someone had texted me that they were wondering about heirs and how do you talk them into, you know, financing and stuff. And you had this in your course. And what I liked was two things, not just, not just what you said, but also how you've set this up. I, I liked um, just visually how you set this up to be able to break it down and be able to show yourself and others, you know, how you can um, talk to them about it. Anyway, here, can you, right, can I, you cover that a little bit? To, if I were talking to people, I would present this in the form of a T-bar. Right. And so what happens on the left hand side, I'd say, here's your present position. The house is costing you $6,000 a year for property taxes, 2,500 for insurance, 1,500 for utilities, 2,500 for lawn and pool maintenance. And then you got a first mortgage that costs $9,000. So your cash flow owning this free and clear house is $21,500 negative. So if you give the house to me, you've got an extra $21,500 a year in income. See, and people miss the fact that expenses escaped our return to the people who gave up the property. It's a big mistake to miss that in your negotiation. I'm I presented a deal today that I believe is going to close. It's exactly this. A gentleman inherited a house. It's free and clear. Mom left it to him. He's got a stepped up basis because of the inheritance. But that house costs $12,000 a year in negative cash flow for taxes, insurance, and maintenance. And I'm confident that it will cost more than that but this is the free, he just got it. And that, that's the quote he gave me when I asked him the questions, what are the taxes? What's the insurance? What's the maintenance? What's the lawn care? And he decided it was about 12,000 a year, but he had not thought about it until I asked him those questions. The offer that was made to him that he accepted in he verbally accepted, I, I've not yet seen a contract, this literally was this afternoon, was 1500 a month in payments coming in. 1500 a month times 12 is $18,000. So by escaping the 12000 a year in negative cash flow and taking 18000 in positive cash flow, his cash flow change, he's $30,000 a year better off for having made the sale. And that was the exact same situation as this. The example from the paper course was heirs plural. The guy I talked to today was a single guy who inherited his mom's house, but it was the same situation. Negative cash flow traded for positive cash flow. I know I have one that's um, not far from one of my properties on the same street. Great, great, great neighborhood. Great everything about it. It's been empty for a while, and I've tried to do skip, skip tracing and find them. It, it, it appears to be abandoned, um, but uh, no one, you know, I, anyway, I can't connect with that. Here's what I found out just recently, though. I found someone who knows did, the did lady who owns it. Did you put a for sale sign in the yard it. of that house? Did you put a for sale sign in the yard of that house? 
Oh man, I forgot all about that. Oh That's gosh, I can do stop. that tomorrow. But what you do is I might can actually do that tonight. If you're sensitive about it, you do what Bill Cook does. You put for sale, and then you put a little teeny question mark after it. So you can say, oh, I was just asking. <laughs> See, I always well, say, here's oh, what I, I wondered what happened to that sign. But Bill actually puts a question mark after for sale. Hey, I know uh, maybe it was with you or in your class or something. Somebody told us about they ran over somebody's uh, mailbox in a house that they wanted to find out about. And, uh, and that got the, somebody, you know, and then they left a note there and said, I ran over it. Was that you, Bill, or who was that? Yeah, it was, it, was, it was my friend, Carrie Milligan. You, you know, y'all, y'all. well, Adrian knows Carrie Milligan, but yeah, he ran over a mailbox, backed over it. He'd been trying to find the people for about four or five weeks, left four or five offers in the door, nothing. So he backed over the mailbox by accident, truly by, <clears throat> by accident. And then um, he went and put a note, took down the offer, put another note in the door and said, I'm very sorry, I ran over your mailbox. I feel terrible about this. And he didn't even get home before they called him and you know, thanked him for um, you know, being honest. And then he ran over it. He said, you know, just, you know, we'll get a book from Home Depot and you can pick out whatever mailbox you want, I will replace it. And I thought that was insight that he didn't see. And the insight was, I started taking my dually out and run over people's mailboxes that wouldn't call me back. <laughs> I don't even know the door, so I'm really sorry I hit your mailbox, but for a hundred bucks, you got to talk to them face to face. Are you kidding me? That was a great way to meet people. I've talked to a lot of people. I've never run over a mailbox. You, you should try it. It's it could fun. be a first meet. Yeah. Well, I might, I might go out there tonight. I'm thinking about it. Uh, Pete, here's the thing on that one. Here, I'd like your input on this. I did find out from a neighbor finally, I found somebody who knew uh, this lady very well. And evidently she became elderly, her husband died and then she became elderly and she's a hoarder. So she filled up her whole house full of stuff. And at some point, you know, she was getting on an age and one of her relatives came down here from up north and they got her and they took her up there. She's, she's cognizant, I mean, she's able to, you know, think and talk and all that stuff. but. She's kept the house because she's got her stuff in there. She doesn't want to get yep. rid of it. What yep. kind of approach would you have with someone like that? Uh, well, number one, I'd be very careful to document her competency. And, and the reason you need to do that, um, when my son Pete got out of high school, he bought his very first house from an older lady. Um, and because I just, I love people. Her brother had died. She couldn't stay there by herself. She wanted to move into another place. It cost $4,000 to move her. I gave her a note for the balance of her equity. I picked her up on the day of closing, took her out to Denny's, then took her from Denny's to uh, her attorney's office uh, where we did a closing. And she was an elderly woman, but she was sharp as could be. Years later, her family accused us of taking advantage of an incompetent woman. And indeed, at that time, she was not competent. And we were just lucky. Had we done a mail away, had we not gone with her, see, the attorney said, no, no, I remember Mrs. Jones. And the lady who sold the title insurance said, oh, no, I remember. And so I had three people who were in the attorney's office with me attest to the competence, but that was only me being lucky in that situation because she surely didn't appear that way five years later when that accusation came down. So anytime there's an older person and there's any question of that, I'd be cautious. Now, I will tell you, I have messed up on quarter houses. I walked away from the house because I just was so discouraged with all the stuff in it. Um, and the lady sent me a really nice letter and thanked me for all her help, uh, all the help I gave her. But most of what I was giving her was encouragement, but I just couldn't face uh, the stuff she had stacked in that house. And so I didn't buy the house much to my chagrin because today the house is doubled in value and I would, it would have been a killer deal to have bought it. But I didn't know what to do with the, all the stuff. 
I, I got tired looking at it, trying to elbow my way in between all the crap. But <laughs> so, this past summer, I bought an 840 square foot, two bedroom, one bath house. The lady had lived in since 1953. And I paid a guy to take three tons, three and a half tons of stuff out of that house and get rid of it for me. It cost a thousand bucks to get that guy to go down there with his truck and go back and forth, but it was well worth the thousand dollars. So instead of taking it personally, I just paid the guys, I don't care. If you find gold in there, you can you tell me or don't tell me, but get all that crap out of the house. I want the house. So a few <laughs> years ago, I walked away because I get discouraged by it. This time, I didn't make that mistake. I, I paid Ron. Ron went down there. Three and a half tons in 840 square feet. So Pete, how would you document someone's competency, especially if they're out of state, like in this situation where this lady is, and I, I don't know how I would, what would you do? You might close with their attorney. You might insist that there be a doctor. Uh, you know, my, my uh, mother-in-law is 103 years old and she is as sharp as can be. And, uh, you know, we, 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 we're finding she's got extraordinary credit. So we got her out buying houses, but if I were buying a house from her, as sharp as I know she is, I would want to be certain that some third party attested to the fact that she was competent when we made the deal. But now, how would you word that to somebody? Hey, I, you might be crazy. I don't know. Uh, would you, would you, you know, doc, no, I wouldn't help say me dog with this? I mean, crazy. come on, what would you say? say well, I mean, <laughs> see, everyone I know is crazy. I and mean, just, just listen to this group. <laughs> Uh, but <laughs> I tell people all the time, you know, as I get crazier than I already am, I talk about the stories. I tell a story about the lady who was very competent, but the family accused me later of it. And I say, you know, I'd like to make sure that doesn't happen again. And I teach with the stories. So I tell a story about a competency problem and say, I really would like to protect us from that kind of a situation. And they, they may have a doctor, they may have an attorney. Uh, many times when I'm buying a house from an older person or an older couple, I will tell them, this is a killer deal. I mean, I'm going to put a picture of you guys in my house as a tribute to this great deal you made that helped my family become wealthy. And you should make this deal with your family and keep this property in your family. And what happens is they're going to talk to their, their family members anyway. And so they, they say, gee, Mr. Fortunato said he's going to pay me a thousand a month, but he said, I should keep it in the family. Would you guys pay me a thousand a month? I'll sell the house to you. And what do the kids always <laughs> say? No, 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 oh, we'd rather great. wait for you to die and we'll inherit it. And so <laughs> I, I I've never lost a deal for saying that, but I say that all the time. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. I had, um, I had a, go lady ahead, Adrian. a long time ago that I was actually having to go cancel the, the deal on the contract. And she was really nice. She was completely competent. She knew what she was doing very, very sharp. And she was, was telling me stories about other things she was doing and apparently someone was trying to rip her off and she said she had planned to go to the courts and say that they were taking advantage of her with elder abuse. She knew how to play the game and they were trying to take advantage of her so she was just going to go there and say elder abuse, elder abuse and she's like I'm going to win. Yeah. Ouch. Yeah, no kidding. You're lucky hey, Pete. you established enough rapport that she told you that before you ended up being her victim. Yeah. Hey, Pete, I know that you like to teach with stories. Is it true that you're going to be teaching um, a seminar this fall about rehabbing? <laughs> Everyone who knows me <laughs> has gotten a great class in rehabbing watching me attempt this rehab I'm doing now. I recognize that <laughs> voice. <laughs> 
How you doing, Andy? <laughs> I'm doing great. Oh my god. I would well, even well, sign up for that rehab class. <laughs> well, it, it, it's, it's, been, it's been a really interesting rehab because it got started somewhere around August. It's going to be done at the end of August 2019. And I, I think you've outdone Nick Burby. So I think you should teach your class, Pete. And it's really great. Yeah. Um, you can co teach I, with Nick. I did a rehab when I was 19. It was a disaster. I said, I will never do it again. And then at the age of 72, I tried it again and found out I was absolutely right when I was 19. Some people just aren't built for it. Just that's so all I, there is to it, Pete. And, and emotionally, <laughs> I'm not built for it because I get so discouraged showing up and seeing <laughs> no one's done what they promised. Uh, I finally ended up breaking down and buying appliances, which I hate to do because that just means you get terrible tenants. Um, so <laughs> I bought the appliances and got a telephone call from the appliance guy. And he said, I'm at the house and there's no one here. And I said, there is someone there. He said, no, he said, I'm, I'm here. We, you know, we can't wait. We're either going to take the appliances back or we're going to drop them in the yard. And so um, I drove over there to find the guy I was paying $25 an hour sleeping in the living room. Uh, and it just, it, it, it just breaks your heart. I, I'm not a rehabber. I'm not doing it anymore. I'm done. I, I, I was able to stay away from it for 50 years until I broke down when I was age 72. And I'm not doing it. Well, what's nice is you have friends that don't bust you about it, Pete. Oh, no, never. <laughs> you ought to go to hey, you just mentioned with me someone. <laughs> you just mentioned something nonchalantly there about the appliances. You said... What did you say about that? That uh, they only brought you bad tenants. I don't put appliances in houses because if you put appliances in, you get short-term tenants. Oh, okay. I, I didn't put them in, in one of the last rentals I did because I was too cheap. But but I like your reason better. <laughs> yeah, and if there's an appliance, like if a tenant leaves an appliance, which they usually do. I just give them to the new tenant. I say, look, no, I don't do, I'm not in the appliance business, I'm in the real estate business. And you can have the appliance. If you don't like it, trade it in and get yourself a new one. I don't do furnished rentals. My job is to get a good tenant who's gonna stay the rest of their life. Could you elaborate on that, Pete, why that's so? The less, the less work it is to move in, the easier it is to move out. Ah, okay. Makes sense. Thank hey, you. Pete, hey, Pete, I just found out evidently someone has text Nick Burby or he's on the call I didn't know about, but he's sitting there burning up my text messages. So he's very glad that you have taken over to being king of rehab to replace him. Well, Nick's been a good friend for years. I know he'd never make me feel bad. <laughs> but some of your other friends will. <laughs> yeah, and, and do, actually. What's that saying with so, friends like that? He needs enemies. <laughs> no, no, uh, so, Pete, just, I have a, a... Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Pete. Sorry. No, well, I, you know, management, you guys heard David, and David Tilney is certainly much, much better than me. But I would say one of the things that I do when I'm trying to acquire property, I'm going to acquire property around what I consider to be an anchor. An anchor is something that builds an extended family in its community. That would be big active churches, good private schools, community centers, perhaps even a, uh, a mall kind of a place where people congregate and get to know one another. Those kinds of neighborhoods retain tenants. And it's not the, uh, the day in day out management. It's the placing of the right person in those houses uh, that enables you to keep houses for years and years and years and years and years to get the advantage of the growth in equity that comes 
from appreciation and amortization. Then the cash flow comes because they eventually pay the place off. But it is the anchor in the neighborhood where the house exists that makes for the quality of tenant in my view. Now, Pete, I have some folks on here that um, have a similar question, so I'm going to ask it to you this way. So let's say that you were over 60 years old and you were just really starting uh, to do this. You've got some re maybe a little retirement money or pension or whatever, so you're not yeah. broke or anything, but you, you're just starting in real estate. What would you advise them on or can you advise them? Like, what can they focus on you? They come to these, our meetings, they talk to a lot of people, they're networking. Everybody's got a different way that they're making money in real estate. But if you're over 60, you, you, they're not wanting to do that long haul. They also maybe don't have uh, children or grandchildren they want to give anything to. They just don't want to give anybody anything. But they want to take care of themselves as they go toward <laughs> old age. So, so what would you, so what would you recommend? What, well, you got to find out what it is that they need. You take a look again at the picture of the house. Um, I, I have two friends who retired from major corporations with pensions. The pensions gave them barely enough. And so I'm, vis I'm envisioning them as being uh, the kind of people that you're talking about here. Each of them. Yeah, so people that just have social security, you know. Yeah, they were, each of them went out and bought three houses that, now not three at a time, one at a time, but they got three houses that broke even. The increased rents in the last few years have been their inflation hedge because the increased rents created cash flow, which was added to their pension. Now, one of them in particular used all his excess cash flow to reduce debt, which is, I'm not sure, uh, a wise thing to do, but he did free and clear three houses in 10 years that are currently rented for $1,250 a month. So those houses net $750 a month times three. That's a substantial additional amount of income for them to have. I mentioned earlier the two guys I talked to this year who sold their house, bought a, uh, a duplex moved into one side and their vacation renting the other side to supplement their income. I had in June of last year when I did acquisition here in Tampa, I had a man who I'd known for years and years and years come to the class and he's in his 80s. And I was surprised he was in the class. But I said, well, you know, people who like to learn and people who are aggressive tend to come back. Right. And so I said, gee, it's really great to see you. You just came back for a refresher. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted you're here. He said, no, no, no. He said, uh, when my wife and I reach age 60, we retired and we sold the houses. I said, well, you know, you had a dozen houses. And he said, no, actually I had 18 houses. And he said, we bought them and we kept them and they were free and clear. And when we got to be our early 60s, we sold the houses and did installment sales and carried the paper. And now that he's in his 80s, guess what happened? It's been 20 years since he retired. All the paper is gone. He has no more income except Social Security. So he was in the class not for a refresher, but say, how in the world can I generate more income? Well, what he had was the ability to buy and manage and free and clear 18 houses over a 30 to 40 year investment life. So from the time he was 20 till the time he and his wife were 60. So I told him that my best recommendation for him 
was to use those management skills he had and go out and sandwich lease some properties or buy with seller financing on with performance based seller financing so he can build up some more cash flow by bringing the management skills his management skills to the problems other people have but it just was shocking to me that a man who was still he, a man and wife who were skilled enough to acquire 18 nice free and clear houses would have been foolish or short-sighted enough to convert all that equity to paper. He just lived too long there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I told him, I said, if, if you been, if you knew your death date, so you were gonna like you were planning suicide, then fine. <laughs> well oh, Pete. And plus and plus with the paper you're not indexed for inflation the way you are with the houses. Yeah. Well, and see, like when I carry paper, I'll carry paper to make a deal. I use paper and deals all the time, but I'm going to use them. I have great confidence in my ability to trade the paper to get back to real estate. So I might carry paper to get rid of something I don't want. As an example of that, um, I bought some houses from a retired CPA after his wife died, and he had. Uh, six houses that he bought so that when he predeceased his wife because that's the way their plans were she would have six houses to give her income to give her a better life then when she died he just wanted to get rid of those houses those houses had bad memories he bought them to provide income for his wife his wife was gone and so i bought those houses from him this was a long time ago. I bought them all for a quarter million dollars, no money down, payable over 180 months, 15 years, no interest, just payments. I bought the houses. The trouble was two of those six houses were in awful, underlying, awful neighborhoods. So I tried to not take those but indeed to only take four. But he insisted that we had to buy the entire portfolio to make the deal. So I gave him other collateral. So the two houses in the terrible neighborhoods came to me with no mortgage against them. Because remember the example of, of greater collateral, larger collateral, closer to home collateral? I gave him better houses as collateral. I got those two houses. One of those houses, well, both of them were in South St. Pete, but one of them was just a dreadful, dreadful neighborhood. I sold that house for $30,000, no money down, $150 a month, no interest, in order to get rid of that house because I didn't want that house in my portfolio. That's the kind of decisions you need to make. And when you're a kid, you just say, anything I can get, I'm gonna grab. But that house would have broken my heart. And the person who bought it for me did a, an extensive rehab and ended up selling the property for $68,000. And I was thrilled to death for her. But I wouldn't have done that. And selling the property and carrying paper with no interest and no money down still made better sense to me than to keep that house. You know, Pete, um, I was going to ask you this question and you've pretty much answered it. Uh, the question was, what's better houses or paper? But there is <laughs> one thing that I have to ask you, okay? And that is, why does Mike Meeker say you're wrong? Because he's wrong. <laughs> no, he's not. Mike is a very smart man. Mike is never wrong. Mike is a very smart man who's a hermit who does not want to deal with human beings. <laughs> you know, I was set up to ask you that I, question, I, I, right? I, and I, am, I, I, I have no, no idea why. I, I definitely <laughs> knew that, yes. 
I heard. Oh, Mike, I'm so voice, innocent here. I heard Bill's voice, no matter whose voice presented that question. <laughs> <laughs> I was just pointing out how smart Mike Meeker is, and uh, Nick Burby is burning up my phone. He sent me several sexy pictures of himself in a speedo. Oh my God! <laughs> please please keep yourself. those to yourself. Yes, even I agree with that one. <laughs> yeah, I can't get those pictures out of my mind. I wish Nick Burby would stop. Yeah. Hey, it's Pete, um, I'm going to, uh, because of the time of night, we're going to officially end the meeting in just a little bit, but I want to get a couple of these questions into you before we wrap this part of our meeting up. And, okay, can uh, I say folks something else about paper me. before that, or would you rather me wait and talk about paper later? Uh, either way, I'd rather I, answer we're the here question. for you. If someone's on, let's hear the questions. Okay, let's do it then. Um, one person was asking, uh, you mentioned a while back in, in, the, in the meeting here, why is subject to so bad with a pretender lender? They were curious on that. Well, I've lost a quarter million dollars doing it, so my family discourages that. Uh, pretender lenders are not the lender. It's not their money, so they don't make rational decisions. See, think for a moment. If I owed you uh, uh, let's just take a hundred thousand dollar mortgage at six percent, and I hadn't uh, paid you because I got sick. And someone from this meeting, who you know, came along and said, "Listen, I'd like to buy the, the house from Pete, and I'll bring the loan current. Would you waive the due on sale clause for me?" What would you say to him? Yes. No, no Probably. You know, how, soon yes. You, how soon can you get here? Yeah. What happens if the mortgage was at 12%? Would you be happy to have somebody bring it current and make payments? Oh, yeah. Yes. If it was your money, why does a pretender lender say, oh, no? Why don't you do a short sale like everyone else? because they get paid fees to provide services. They don't care about the yield. So they make crazy decisions and they refuse to do things that a rational person would do. The other thing that happens is because they convert from, a, from one servicer to the next, they lose track and they misapply funds. And so, for example, I bought a property, got a letter on the VA loan from the VA saying deal with Peter Fortunato for the life of this loan, was paying leader mortgage as the servicer, paid them for years, had an estoppel letter showing the balance was $90,000, and then got foreclosed by U.S. Bank. Who's U.S. Bank? I told them to go look at the, the file. I had all the canceled checks. Went to, to court, which was just disgraceful, and said to the judge, here's the canceled checks. Does this suggest that maybe we've made the payments? And the judge said, well, a bank wouldn't lie. And so I ended up paying $117,000 to pay off a $90,000 mortgage. My, I, I don't want to do that anymore. So a pretender lender with a servicer that'll misapply funds, that'll put funds in suspense accounts and then tell you you haven't made a mortgage payment, that's too risky yeah. for me. Now, would I buy it subject to? Greed sometimes overcomes me and I will, but I will then replace it like the example I gave of the fleet mortgage where I bought a property subject to but then I replaced it with an IRA. Okay. Now, oh, very good. But I buy subject to often. If I can buy subject to a local credit union, I can win and see them. I bought subject to a half a million dollar mortgage with a, a, a bank on um, a commercial bank on Fourth Street, where I went in and got a waiver of due on sale clause for enabling them to make that deal. I buy subject to 
private financing, where it was an installment sale, where the last thing the people want is to get paid off and create a taxable event for them. I buy subject to private loans where people sold in order to escape the management or to get out of town. And the last thing what they want to do is take a property back and take the management back. So there's many reasons to take title subject to, but the pretender lender is the most dangerous of all of them. And so I avoid that or I close and pay it off as fast as I possibly can. Excellent, excellent. Two more questions here. One is uh, from Anthony from California, our friend from out there. What <laughs> strategies do you recommend now that we know that the income isn't certain with the virus and the politics? How can we be more safe? Oh, crap. Oh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you did. Here he goes. <laughs> no. The, the, the way you create safety in a deal is with performance based promises. For example, we have done six in 50 plus years houses that we bought to resell. Every one of them, we said, we'll buy the house. We'll fix the house, we'll sell the house, and then when we sell it, we will pay you. Until it's sold, we won't pay you. That creates safety in the buy-sell arena. Now, with a rental, we made an offer today to buy a property and pay the person 50% of the gross rents until the debt is paid. So as rents go up, we'll pay more. When the property's vacant, what's 50% of zero? That's a relatively safe payment. And so performance-based promises gives you the most safety. Now that said, it doesn't give you the highest yield because it's in relieving people from risk that you get the best deals because people are fearful. This is America. People want to be taken care of. So we don't do performance. I've never done a performance-based lease. Every sandwich lease that I've done is, I'll give you $15,000 a year, get out of my way and let me have the house. And so I give them $15,000 and I lease the place for $2,000 a month and I collect $24,000 on fifteen. dollars Well, getting $24,000 a year on $15,000 is a pretty good return. But I'm taking all the risk by fronting $15,000. So if your job, if your premise is that you're going to avoid risk at all costs, then you're going to get less because you're giving less, because it's in insulating people from risk that the biggest rewards are obtained. There, that was a good one. So the uh, Keith is asking, how would you present an offer to someone free and clear or close it or close to it who may be moving into an assisted living facility? Well, first thing I find out is what's it cost to go live in the assisted living facility? Because then you know what it's going to cost then, them. Then I got an idea. And that's what they're going to need. How, how much they're going to need. Now, that amount they're going to need, they, they have some money coming from whatever kind of insurance, from what the family can afford. But I can then boil it down to how much extra help they have. And if indeed I can make that work. Um, the bigger issue is people have, they go on all kinds of different programs to supplement them and you got to be very careful not to do something that blows up their benefits in some program uh, for example some programs to, to help people who are somehow handicapped or aged and and need help living uh, are based on net worth so in that case you want to be very careful about increasing their net worth others are based on income other programs 
are based on a combination. And you need to find out what programs they're in and what creates a violation. I have a very good friend whose wife had a, uh, had, had a medical issue, which ultimately she passed away from, but there was an enormous amount of, of medicine needed in the multi-thousands of dollars every month in medicines. And her aunt gave her a car when the aunt bought her new car. She gave her a 10-year-old car that it turned out was had an NADA book value of $4,500, which made her niece's net worth too great. And so they canceled the payment for her medication. And those were anti-rejection drugs, which she couldn't live without. And so as, as naive and as simple a thing as giving your niece a $4,000 car, that is an investigation you need to have before you do anything with someone who's on that kind of a program. I will tell you a person who's not on that kind of program that we looked at and we've not done this deal, but I, I think this is a deal that will get done. And if not with her, it'll be done with other people. Uh, we're looking at a lady who's got a waterfront house with a pool and a dock, uh, big house, 2,500 square feet. And she's been living there. Her husband's passed away. It's got a reverse mortgage on it. She wants to sell the house and find a little place nearby in which to live because she's lived in that neighborhood for 40 years. Well, as expensive as things are today, anything she gets is going to be too expensive for her. So what we're suggesting is we will carve out of that 2,500 square foot house a 500 square foot one bedroom efficiency apartment for her so she can continue to live in that house. And we will have a three bedroom, 2,000 square foot rest of that house, which we can either live in and enjoy or sandwich lease and provide her with more income. And I think that is something with people in that situation with a reverse mortgage, that's something to watch for. That's an opportunity to help them and to really live above your means for some of us. That's one of the things that the woman who was just divorced and was looking for a place to go, that might have been an ideal solution for her. I love that idea of carving out a portion of the house to let her live there and take it over. Yeah. That is good. Awesome. So listen, uh, if you guys were at the fir on at the first part of our meeting, what I said to you was that at some point at the night, we would go ahead and end the evening because some people need that sort of closure and they will go away and say good night and all that good stuff. But the rest of us are going to stay on as sort of a happy hour after the meeting. And uh, we're just going to go and keep... at nine o'clock. I thought everybody left. I thought I was talking to like two people. No, 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 no. That, it was just too good. I couldn't close it right then. I just couldn't do it. So I'm going to do it. And I, plus we wanted to get to those questions on the side that people really, and I know you wanted to, to take care of them. So I think we've pretty much done that. And um, Pete, what I want to say is, so I want to tell everybody, please stay on. This is going to continue for a little while. Uh, we so are getting uh, amazing amounts of information tonight. I think I wrote down here uh, something just to remind us of what you've gone over tonight, uh, as in, please, um, after caring, after learning, then you have to take action. After take action, you absolutely must persevere. That's key things that just an overview of all of this can be thrown into that right there. I thought that was so valuable that you gave that to us, Pete. And so everybody, please take that with you. And uh, what I want to say to everyone, I am so grateful for everybody that's been on the call here tonight in this true spirit. 
of PC RIA's motto of investors helping investors. Thank you very much for inviting us into your home tonight. Be safe and God bless. We're here for you and we'll hope to see you at the next meeting.